Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ken Stroop, and I am the Chief of Staff at the Center for Politics. And on behalf of everyone at the Center, I want to welcome you to the launch of the Kennedy Half Century. Uh, this project has been, as Mr. Sabato will tell you tonight, has been about five years uh, in the making. And it's really a much larger experience uh, than a book alone. It was to focus on this seminal moment in American history, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy, and try to translate that into resources that are available to a lot of different audiences across a lot of different media. So as our panelists are getting settled, and please just come on, come on in and have a seat as I'm, uh, as I'm talking about this. Everyone from the panel, just feel free to come on in and, and have a seat. Um, what we're going to show you, there are many different resources uh, that will be available in addition to the book and the lectures and many of the anniversary programs that we've hosted over the last five years. Uh, there is also an app. Uh, there will also be an iTunes U course uh, and a course on Coursera. These are four week long uh, courses and they are absolutely free of charge. So there's no fee. And if you're interested in taking any of the courses, how many of you might already be registered to take one of the online courses? All right, so quite a few of you and quite a few of you still are not registered. You still have the opportunity. It will begin um, next Monday. So you have to be in class next Monday. And in class can be wherever you have a mobile phone, a computer, any comfortable place in your house. There are no tests. There are no books that you have to buy. It's just the best of all possible worlds for taking classes. So I encourage you to take advantage of it. And I'm going to show you just very briefly the opening trailer uh, for the MOOC. A MOOC, by the way, stands for Massive Open Online Course. And if you're interested in enrolling for this Massive Open Online Course, you just go to Coursera.org. And when you're on there, you can either search for Sabato or Kennedy. It's the only Sabato or Kennedy class that's being taught on Coursera. So it's real easy to find. Also, if you're interested in using it on your iTunes devices, your iPad or your iPhone, you can simply go to iTunes U, iTunes University. Uh, and again, search for either Sabato or Kennedy. It's the only Sabato or Kennedy course that's being offered on the entire Apple iTunes U platform. Uh, this message brought to you by the Center for Politics. <laughs> so if we could, uh, let's just run the uh, opening trailer and give opening MOOC trailer and give everyone an idea of what they might expect. And then I'll be back to uh, introduce uh, the director of the center. So we run the video, please. Air Force One is on final approach now. Hunt on the ground. The morning rain clouds over Dallas were gone, but the clouds over a nation were just beginning to form. The cameras caught Mrs. Kennedy stepping off the plane first. As they came down the plane stairway, a cheer went up from the crowd of spectators. They had been waiting all morning to catch a glimpse of the world's most famous couple. Anyone with a pistol could have fired at them. The agents were relieved when the Kennedys finally climbed into the back seat of their convertible. Everyone in Dallas knew the precise details of the president's route. It had been printed in the newspapers and discussed on local television during the week. Pretty good crowd there. Big crowd, yes. The motorcade traveled along Main Street and then turned right onto Houston. Looming directly ahead was the nondescript Texas School Book Depository. Seconds later, the motorcade slowed for an unusual hairpin left turn onto Elm Street. We want a time tunnel to 1963 so we can shout, go back to Air Force One. But the celluloid figures can't hear a warning. The 
early reports were confusing. It was difficult to separate fact from rumor. And then the news came. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. In the blink of an eye, America had changed forever. The youngest elected chief executive in U.S. history became the youngest to die. Political power is created in many ways, winning an election, facing down an enemy, or skillfully riding the waves of popular opinion. But lasting power is accorded to only a handful of presidents, especially after their death. There is no doubt that John Kennedy is one of the few. The tragedy overwhelmed the public's senses and raised a host of painful questions. Why did it happen? How could it happen? November 22, 1963 was so powerful a moment in the national psyche that in the 50 years since the assassination, Democratic and Republican presidents alike have used Kennedy's words and actions in an effort to craft their own political images. Why does Kennedy's influence persist and will it continue? We'll address these questions and much more as we explore the Kennedy half century. So that is the uh, opening video uh, for the massive open online course. And again, feel free to go to Coursera.org and search for either Sabato or Kennedy, and you can register for that class, which will begin next Monday. As I said, there are no books that are required, uh, but for those of you who are interested in purchasing a signed copy of the Kennedy Half Century, makes a great Christmas gift, uh, the bookstore is here tonight. They are selling, they're pre-selling uh, signed copies. So you will receive a signed copy uh, from the bookstore if you purchase it uh, from the UVA bookstore. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the director of the Center for Politics and the instructor for the class that you're all going to enroll in, uh, Professor Larry Sabato. Thank you. You know, Ken is, is so understated. This makes a wonderful holiday. They get any holiday. Don't, don't restrict it to Christmas. Halloween's coming up. There were Halloweenish aspects, unfortunately, to, to uh, this story. So, um, uh, you know, I'm just going to tell you. Plus, there's a discount for bulk orders. I don't know if any one-stop shopping. All your relatives, you can send them to us. We'll autograph them. We'll inscribe them as long as there are no obscenities. And uh, I've gotten some. You, you'd be surprised. People write in and tell you to say terrible things about their mother-in-law. But I'm not going to do that. <clears throat> but look, I really hope that you will sign up for one. The Center for Politics is the beneficiary, and we want to, uh, to get this private support. <laughs> Who knows when our state government will shut down? <laughs> and, um, and then we'll really be on our own. I wouldn't be surprised. Well, look, um, good evening. And I'm uh, just fresh back from New York where we did our first rollout of the book, and then we go to D.C. tomorrow and then all over the place as of Wednesday and Thursday and Friday. Uh, but uh, this is really the first big installment of uh, the Kennedy Legacy Project. We've had some panels over the last couple of years, and we're specifically, obviously, marking the 50th anniversary of the assassination of President Kennedy. For those of you of a certain age, and I'm of that certain age, and a lot of you are, though probably half of you are lying about it, but you're there, and some of your relatives know that. You remember it. You can see it. You recall where you were, exactly where you were, and who said what. It's one of those flashbulb moments that in our lifetime we never forget. And we tell other people about it all through our lives. For others of you who are younger, this period may seem like dusty history to you. It does to some of my students. Uh, they, they don't immediately see the relevance of it. But that's why we do these projects, because we try to get people involved in politics. Get people involved in politics using everything at our disposal, and history is a good hook. And that's why we do these 50th anniversary programs. Well, tomorrow I'm going to have my say at a special news conference at the museum in Washington, D.C. I'm going to give my perspectives on these subjects, 
And if you like that video, wait till you see the ones we've got tomorrow. Um, they're, they're really special. And all these will be live streamed on the center's website. Right, Kim? It is on the center's website. I've been away, so I've been off sick. Not sure about all this stuff. All right, and we're also going to launch, <laughs> did I mention this book, The Kennedy Half Century? I think maybe I did. Uh, so I'm going to discuss my conclusions then. Uh, if you haven't already, we invite you to enroll in the MOOC, and Ken just said that, so I can skip this portion of the script. It's free, and you don't take any tests. I heard him say that, but I have learned those are the two magic words. <laughs> free, no tests. It's hyphenated. That's why it's two words. Uh, so, you know, it's wor well worth doing. Tonight, we have an opportunity to hear not just some other voices, but some extraordinary voices, some special voices. And I'm going to explain to you why they are special. We have with us several key witnesses who were in Dallas on November 22nd, along with some well-respected authors who studied and written extensively about the events of that awful day. Our guests disagree on the whodunit of the assassination, and as such, they well represent the contrary opinions that still roil the waters. I can tell you from the emails and tweets I got today how diverse the opinions are out there. Everybody's got a, got a, um, got a theory. I've heard every theory but a UFO. It's the only one I haven't heard involved in the Kennedy assassination yet, and I'm sure it's coming. It's only a matter of time. Uh, now, I'd like to tell you that you're going to hear everything there is to hear tonight, but you won't. The Kennedy assassination, having spent many years looking into it myself, is one of the most complex and intriguing series of events in American history. There is layer upon layer of nuance, and we could never begin to cover it in this short program. We'll try to hit the high points, and you'll have a chance to ask questions at these microphones a little bit later. So let me begin the introductions, because I'm just so excited that, that these individuals have come to be with us, and they've all traveled a long way, and I hope you'll express your appreciation to them uh, with your Virginia hospitality. Uh, Wesley Buell Frazier, right down at the end there. Mr. Frazier drove Lee Harvey Oswald to work occasionally and did so on November 22nd. 1963. He's the one who drove Oswald to the Texas School Book Depository and saw the package that Oswald described as curtain rods. Some thought it was a disassembled gun. Mr. Frazier's going to tell us what he thinks. By the way, Mr. Frazier, do you know <coughs> that tomorrow is the 50th anniversary of your beginning to train Lee Harvey Oswald at the Texas School Book Depository? It was 50 years ago tomorrow. And you haven't aged a bit. <laughs> just wanna, I just want to throw that in, okay? Uh, Mr. Frazier was, uh, also witnessed the assassination. He was there in the Texas School Book Depository Building, or I guess right outside, he'll tell us, and saw what happened. And he was also detained and questioned by the Dallas police because he had uh, driven Lee Harvey Oswald into the Texas School Book Depository. He was interviewed for hours by a tag team of officers and, and Captain Will Fritz, eventually put a typewritten confession in front of him and insisted he sign it. This is the way it used to be done. <laughs> Not just in Dallas, <laughs> all over the place. All this before a lot of Supreme Court decisions. Uh, Fritz threatened him with physical violence when he refused to confess to involvement in the assassination. He had none whatsoever. And uh, he'll tell us a little more about that. And his wife, Betty, also joins us this evening from Texas. Where's Betty? Thank you, Betty, for making that long trip. Jim Bowles, who's is a fascinating guy, and we've talked to him a number of times. Jim Bowles joined the Dallas Police Department in 1951. That was the year before I was born. I want you to know that. It makes me feel young. Okay. In 1963, Mr. Bowles was the communications supervisor of the dispatch office in the Dallas uh, Police Department. In the years following the assassination, he transcribed the Dallas police audio tapes of that day. And you're going to hear a lot more about them tomorrow at our museum press conference. These tapes were analyzed by the Warren Commission to a certain degree. They were rushed in lots of ways for political agendas. 
and later the House Select Committee on Assassinations in the 1970s for evidence of gunfire in Dealey Plaza. We will have a lot more to say on that tomorrow. Mr. Bowles wrote a manuscript entitled The Kennedy Assassination Tapes, a rebuttal to the acoustics evidence. And the acoustics evidence was presented by the House Select Committee on Assassinations, U.S. House, uh, in the 1970s when they issued their final report in 1979 contradicting the Warren Commission, which said Oswald was the lone gunman. The HSCA said there, was, there probably was a conspiracy in the assassination of President uh, Kennedy. Now, uh, Mr. Bowles uh, has a long, deep background with the police department. He was actually the elected sheriff there for many years, years later after the assassination. He is recognized as the authority on the inner workings of the radio communications of the Dallas Police Department and the corresponding events at the time of the assassination. Uh, his wife, Martha, is here in the audience. And Martha, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate that very, very much. Sid Davis. <coughs> Mr. Davis, uh, is, I'm sorry, I didn't go in order, and I apologize for that. Mr. Davis was also in Dallas in November 20, on November 22nd. Mr. Davis was in the motorcade and heard the shots that killed President Kennedy and wounded Governor Connolly. Then, as a press representative, he witnessed the swearing in of President Johnson aboard Air Force One. He is actually in the iconic photo of that event. He's just behind and to the right of Jackie Kennedy. He had some interesting thoughts for me at dinner, and I hope he'll share those about Jackie Kennedy and how she reacted and how she kept it together. He spent more than 40 years as a reporter, White House correspondent, television network, news executive. Mr. Davis has written for The Washington Post, American Heritage Magazine, TV Quarterly, and Broadcasting Magazine. And we're thrilled that he is here with us. And his son joins us as well, Larry. That Larry, thank you for coming. Great first name, and we appreciate your being here. <laughs> Henry Hurt. Henry Hurt, and, and really, you just you've got to read his book too. After you buy multiple copies of mine, but but those of you who have leftover money have to read his uh, book, Reasonable Doubt: An Investigation into the Assassination of John F. Kennedy. Uh, he's he is very much an investigative reporter and author. The book included an interview with a man named Robert Easterling. And that individual told Mr. Hurt that he had been recruited to drive Lee Harvey Oswald from Dallas, out of Dallas, on November 22, 1963, as part of a larger plan to kill the president. Easterling claimed Jack Ruby and others had been involved in the conspiracy to kill JFK. He named Manuel Rivera as the gunman who killed Kennedy and said that Oswald's rifle had been planted in the book depository to frame Oswald. We'll discuss that in greater detail and there's a lot more in that book. There's an interesting story even behind the book. I don't know if I should tell this, but I, I just have to. Uh, Mr. Hurt is the proud father of our local congressman, Robert Hurt, who along with the rest of Congress is in hiding. Uh, <laughs> You tell him I said that. <laughs> Mr. Hurt's wife, Margaret, and uh, daughter, Elizabeth, have joined him here tonight. Delighted to, to have you all. I know your brothers, both of them. Wild. <laughs> Absolutely wild. The other one's a reporter. So you can imagine those two go at it a lot. Finally, but certainly not least, Jefferson Morley. Let me tell you about Jeff. Of course, he's well named for Mr. Jefferson's university. But he's a veteran of Washington journalism with a proven record of breaking stories on the international media, U.S. foreign policy, and American history. His reporting has appeared all over the place. New York Review of Books, Reader's Digest, which Mr. Hurt, Hurt knows well, the New York Times Book Review, Rolling Stone, The New Republic, The Nation, the L.A. Times, American Prospect, Salon. But I got another book for you to read because for me it was an eye-opener. I'd always had suspicions about the CIA and the connections whether they pulled it off or not, but there were a lot of strange things going on at Langley in the early 1960s. <clears throat> and uh, you need to read his book, Our Man in Mexico, Winston Scott and the Hidden History of the CIA. It is a fascinating read, a beautiful read, and you're going to learn a lot. Some of it you're going to wish you didn't know, but 
we're all adults here, I think. I hope there are no children here. I worry <laughs> about that, if there are. But Jeff also is the moderator of a website that is highly respected and is one of the few on the JFK assassination that I would recommend to you, and I urge you to write this down. JFK Facts, one word, no period. JFKFacts.org. JFKFacts.org. It's a premier site for high quality information about the assassination, uh, and you can actually trust what you read there. It's balanced, doesn't go off any particular deep end, and there are a lot, lots of deep ends and cliffs in the study of this assassination. Ladies and gentlemen, I think. This is probably the most appropriate and distinguished panel we've ever had focused on a single subject. And we've been here a long time. I don't want to tell you how many years. And I want you to join me in giving a warm round of applause to this great group. Now, I'm going to start with Mr. Frazier, and we're, going to go, we're just going to move right straight down the panel because I want to save my two evaluative historians for the end so they can, they can tell us what really happened. But I want to start with Mr. Frazier. I'm going to ask each member of the panel in turn to take, you know, five to seven minutes and tell their story. Tell their story that's connected to the bigger story of the Kennedy assassination. Uh, there are so many subplots in this thing. I mean, you could spend three or four lifetimes studying it. You really could. And it's like jumping down a rabbit hole and you're in Wonderland and, you know, you get lost. You get lost. But they, they have found themselves in time for this panel. Mr. Frazier, tell us your story connected to the assassination. First thing I'd like to say, uh, I thank you for coming here this evening and taking uh, time out of your busy day to hear what we have to say. Um, you have to remember, when I was a, working at the Texas School Book Depository in Dallas, Texas, I was just a young boy. A young 19. Coming from a small town where everybody knows everybody and then come into a big city like Dallas. Um, that was an eye-opener for me. I looked for work and I didn't find any right at first but I kept on looking and through an employment agency by the name of Massey, um, a lady called me one morning and she says, um, I have an interview with a company over in Dallas and it'd be working at a warehouse. And I said, fine. And so I got ready and left the house and went by the office and she gave me uh, the man I'm supposed to see was Mr. Roy Truly, and I interviewed with him, and he hired me, and I started to work there, and, um, and I really enjoyed my work there. Uh, I liked everyone, and uh, we was working real hard, and and I know sometimes we'd work overtime quite a bit, and my sister. Um, she would get together with some of the ladies and in the neighborhood and and they would get together and uh, over coffee or tea and pastry items they would talk about their day or what was going on in their lives and uh, my sister learned that there was a young lady living with uh, Miss Ruth Payne and um, and that her husband was working for work, looking for work, and so Miss Payne asked my sister, uh, Lenny Mae Fraser Randall, if she thought that there was any work available there, and she said, I don't know, I'll ask. And so she asked me, and I said, I will check on that, and I did. The next following day, I 
my supervisor, uh, Mr. Shelley, I asked him, I said, is um, Texas School Books looking to hire more help? And he said, yes, we are. We could use some more help. And so I told him that there was a man looking for work. And you have to remember, I have never met this man. I didn't even know what his name was. And so the man turned out to be Lee Oswald, or Lee Harvey Oswald. And uh, so I sent the information back to my sister, and she told Miss Payne. So Miss Payne got in touch with Lee, and he did apply with the Texas School Book Depository. And the first day that I saw Lee uh, was on the uh, day that he started work there. And I was busy filling orders. And they had a PA system that went all over all the warehouse, and he told me to come to his office. And I reported to his office, and he was standing there, and outside of his office was a man with him. And he told me, he says, uh, Lee is going to be working with us. And he said, I want you to take and teach him everything you know about filling these orders. Um, I learned very quickly, and, uh, and Mr. Shelley had a lot of confidence in me. He said I was a fast learner. So he said, I want you to teach Lee everything you know. And I did my best to do that. Um, Lee Oswald was a, um, he's a very quiet man. And, uh, and, he, and he worked with me uh, very closely. And for the first few days we were there, he was just like my shadow. He was everywhere I was. And uh, so one day we came in and Mr. Shelley asked me, and she said, how's he doing? I said, I think he's going to be okay. But that morning I went to the order boxes where we had the different publishers. And by the way, we had all the big publishers under one roof at Texas School Book Depository. Today, that is no longer the case. But, um, so I picked out some, what I call beginner orders. And I put them on a clipboard and I had a clipboard to Lee. I said, you've been going around with me. I said, we're gonna find out where you are and what you know. And I said, if you have problems, just come find me, I'll help you. Well, Lee did that and he learned very quickly. And that impressed me because he, uh, he strove for perfection. Um, he wasn't a slacker. He was always on time. Uh, he did a great job. And the, when he started to work there, uh, I found out that the lady lived up the street with Miss Payne was his wife. I did not know that at the time. But and I told him, I said, well, anytime you want to go out to see your wife and child, I said, you can ride with me anytime. And so he said, that would really be nice. He said, I'd like to, I'd like to do that on Friday. And, uh, and so I said, will you be riding home with me every day? He said, no. He says, I have a um, room I rent over in Dallas, and I'll go out to see them on the weekend. And that was the arrangement we had. And he went with me every Friday except one. And I'm not, I'm not talking about November the 22nd. I'm talking about another Friday before November the 22nd. And um, so I would uh, take him home on Friday afternoon and drop him in front of Miss Payne's house. And I'd go on my way. Often I'd go to the driving grocery to get a load of bread, a gallon of milk, or whatever my sister told me to bring that afternoon when I come home. And um, that's the arrangement we had, and then all during the weekend, I didn't ever see Lee. We never did anything together. Uh, and on the way to work and, uh, and from work, especially from work, we never stopped for a beer or a soda or anything. Now, you can read a lot of things on the Internet, and a lot of people tell you a lot of stories. Oh, yeah, they were out the rifle range together. Uh, they were in a pastry shop. Well, I'm telling you right now. There's not a word of truth in that. We never stopped anywhere. And I know that mountain sound may sound strange, but that's the way it was. And, uh, and I'm being a 19-year-old kid. During the day when I was there working, I worked with older men. I couldn't be that 19-year-old boy. 
had to be as old as they were. So the weekend gave me the opportunity to be that young boy, uh, going to movies and having a good time. But um, Lee wasn't a real talkative person. By that I mean he wouldn't come up and initiate a conversation. Now, if he did walk up to me during the work, and initiate a conversation. It was strictly work. It was about the invoice, the order he was trying to fill. Um, even when we were riding back and forth, uh, we'd talk about the weather and uh, and we listened to the radio. Uh, we listened to um, a station a lot of time. It was KBOX, and I think the call sign was 1480. And the reason I listened to that, because I was new to Dallas and I got on to that, they would tell you where accidents were. And um, so in between listening to the music and a report of an accident, Lee and I would chat sometime. And I could get a more response out of Lee about his uh, family. My, my Primarily, I'm speaking of his child. Now, Marina was pregnant with the second child, and she gave birth to the second child shortly before the assassination, but I did not know that. Uh, I think the oldest little girl, I think she was somewhere around three, and on the weekends when Lee was out to Irving there, he would not only play with his child, but he would play with a lot of uh, other children in the neighborhood, and some of those other children in the neighborhood was three of my little nieces. and. I never asked him anything. I just would listen to him sometime when we'd sitting around the table eating a meal. They would be talking about something that they had done, some game they had played around the big oak tree. And, um, and the nice things that they would say about Mr. Lee, he would get down on their level and be a child with them. I know there's been a lot of things uh, written and a lot of things said about this man. Uh, I think basically Lee was a nice person. If he had a bad side to him, I never did see that. Um, he was always very honest with me. If I asked him something, he always answered me. Um, and on our ways in and in and out to work, uh, like I said, if I could get a response out of him about his about his child, and I'd ask him maybe sometime on the way in on Monday mornings, I would ask him. I said, "Well, did you have a good time?" And then he would start to chuckle, and he would remember something that had happened during the weekend, and he would tell me about that, playing with the children. Didn't go into a lot of detail, but he would just say he had fun playing with the children in the front yard. Um, I've thought about this a lot. Um, maybe I saw a side to, to Lee Oswald that most people never had the opportunity to see. Um, that morning of November the 22nd was like no other morning, just like any other morning that we'd go to work. Uh, the only thing different was that he had gone out with me on November the 21st. And he come up to me during the, the day on November the 21st and asked him, said, can I ride home with you today? And I said, well, sure. And about within an hour, I was filling an order and I looked at the date on the invoice, and I said, today is not Friday. So when I did see him on the first floor there where we'd bring the orders to uh, ship, various freight orders, I told him, I said, hey, Lee. <clears throat> I said, today's not Friday. He says, I know that. He said, today's Thursday. And he says, I need to go out. And um, he said, uh, Marina's made me some curtains, and, um, and I need some curtain rods to hang the curtains and my room that he rented in Dallas. Now, never going, never have been 
over to the uh, place he rented, the room, he already had curtains in his room, but I didn't know that. And he never gave me any indication that not to believe him. Uh, but on that Friday morning, um, instead of me picking him up, walking down the sidewalk, or picking him up in front of Miss Payne's house, he got up a little earlier and he walked down to my sister's house, which was about uh, half a block away. And my sister was at the sink washing dishes because she had fixed the children's breakfast and my breakfast, and we always ate breakfast together. And these little nieces were were like little sisters to me. Um, anyway, he walked down and he crossed, and my sister was watching dishes at the sink, and she saw Lee um, carrying a package. He walks across, and back in those days, we didn't lock cars, we didn't lock doors. America was in a different time than it is nowadays. And so he walks over and he puts a package on the back seat on the passenger side. And then he, excuse me, then he walks around and he looks in the same window that my sister was looking out, but she had moved over doing something else in the kitchen. And my mother was there and she looks up and she sees this man that she didn't know looking in the window and it startled her. And she says, who is that? And I looked and I said, what? She said, there's a man looking in the window. Well, I looked up and it was Lee. And I said, oh, that's just the man I work with. So I got up from the table, I walked over to the door and I told him I was just about through eating my breakfast. I said, do you want to come in? He said, no. He said, I'll just stand out here and wait for you. And so I went back to the table and I finished eating my, my food. I got up from the table, uh, took my dishes over to the sink, put them in the sink, and went to, walked to the uh, bathroom and brushed my teeth. And by the time I did all that and come back, my sister had my lunch ready. She always made my lunch. Very few times when I went to work, I didn't take my lunch because I'd really take my lunch because I knew what I was going to eat. And I could sit down in the basement where it was nice and cool. That's where I put my lunch all the time. And I, if, during the day, if I was filling an order for a book and I would see a book that I had an interest in, well, guess what I did during my lunch break? While I was eating my lunch, I was thumbing through that book looking because I was always trying to learn something that I didn't know. Uh, but, as I said, that day was no different than any other. The only thing was that morning uh, when I walked out of the uh, back door onto the carport and we walked together to the car, and as we, as we were getting in the car and I was sitting down, I glanced over my shoulder to talk to him, and I caught him glimpse of a package on the back seat. And I said, what's in the package, Lee? He says, don't you remember? He says, they're curtain rods. I said, okay. And I never thought anything else about it. Why would I doubt the man? He never lied to me. He didn't have to lie to me about anything. So uh, we went on to work and the package was about uh, 24 to 26 inches long, give or take an inch. And uh, I never thought much about the package on the way to work. And that morning, uh, the weather it was overcast and it was misting rain. And the rain was so fine, it was about the size of, um, of a needle or a straight pin hitting on your windshield. And back in those days, we didn't have uh, we didn't have intermittent wipers, so you had to turn them on and turn them off. And so I said on the way to work, I said, I wish it'd rain or just stop. Well, I had to do that all the way back and forth to work, turn them on every so far, every so often. Uh, and we get on to work. Uh, Lee didn't talk much that morning, like just like any other morning. Uh, 
and we got to the parking lot where I parked my car. And the thing is, the parking lot where I parked my car was a good 200 meters or more from the Texas School Book Building. We had another building down uh, about that distance, and it was a state warehouse a building for Texas School Books. And most of the people that worked there, uh, they didn't own a car, so they their uh, way of getting to work was by the local bus department. They'd ride a bus. and But there was some parking up there at the building at Texas School Books where I was employed, but that was for people like Mr. Shelley, Mr. Truly, Mr. Kaysen, um, people that was in management. And, but the distance I had to walk there back and forth didn't bother me at all because I'd been used to walking a lot in my young life. Um, but that morning when we pulled up there, um, I looked at my watch and I had time. And so for ones of you who are old enough to remember generators and voltage regulators, uh, the voltage regulator was a little black box, about two and a half, three inches long, about a couple inches. Uh, and it sat with a lot of times on your car now where the power steering is. That's where the voltage regulator sat. And I'd been having trouble with my car because the points, if the points would stick, it'd pull all the juice out of your battery. And sometimes you you work overtime and you get down there in the dark and you're trying to start a car. Well, that part of Dallas at that time wasn't a nice place to be after dark. It's pretty rough. And so I said, well, I'm going to build my engine up a little bit and hope I can put enough juice in it that I can start the car when uh, when I get off work. And uh, so Lee had gotten out of the car and he stood there by the car for minute or two and he saw what I was doing so he gets a package out and he starts to walk off to a Texas school box and I didn't think anything about that most of the time we always walk together but we didn't this morning and um, so he got a little further ahead of me and we had to walk across this distance if you go to Dallas Texas now there, that area uh, that I'm talking about, used to be a big rail switching yard there where they'd put trains together. And uh, and it was always very amusing to me because when I was a boy, uh, trains used to really fascinate me and and I was really interested in watching because you got the person in the locomotive and you got somebody down there doing all kind of hand signals, you know, you think you're in a baseball game or something, but it meant something to them. They knew what they was they were communicating and so I watched him put the trains together and as we was walking along he, he kept getting a little further and a little further ahead of me um, and he got to, well you're probably interested about the package the way he carried the package the package the way he carried the package he put one end under his armpit and the other end was the cup down by his side uh, and that's where he carried the package um, so he and I, uh, we get to the Texas School Bucks, not at the same time. He walks up the steps, gets on the dock, goes in to the first floor there. And the uh, time I get there, and I go in the same way he does, when I got there on the first floor, I didn't see anyone. I don't know where Lee was at that time. I really didn't think about it because why should I? He and I worked together. Uh, could he be going to put up, hang up his jacket or whatever? Because that's one of the first things I used to do when I get into work. I'd go down to the basement, take off my jacket, and get ready to go to work, put my lunch up, and go upstairs and go uh, go punch in and clock in, and then go over to the order box and see what I had to do. If there were no orders in there. I always go to Mr. Shell and I said, well don't have any orders down there what do you want me to do well uh, a lot of times I worked with Billy Lovelady he was the guy that did the shipping and receiving and and a lot of times in those days we um, 
we got textbooks in by the cases, and they weren't on pallets like they are now, where you unload them with an electric pallet jack or forklift. It was all stacked. So we had to uh, break the cartons down, separate them, and then Billy would check them off, and then we'd take them up to the different floors where they were stored. I was supposed to go, and that's what we'd, we'd do. Um, I've thought about that day a lot over the years. Um, if I could go back and change anything in my life, that would be one of them. Um, well, I'm sure you'd ask what was in the package, <laughs> or, or maybe ask to see what was in the package. Uh, Mr. Frazier, let me let me stop you there simply because we have to get to the other panels, but I'm going to come back to you and ask you some questions I want to know. For example, did you since you lost track of him, I'm just wondering if you had any any indication whether Lee Oswald went to the sixth floor and maybe dropped the package off. But we'll we'll get to the end. You, can you give me a brief answer on that? Did you um, have any idea if he went to the sixth floor? Uh, no, sir, I do not. I don't know wh where he was. <clears throat> And I didn't, I didn't think to look for him because I had no reason to. Sure. That's per perfectly reasonable. We, we want to come back to, to Mr. Frazier, though, after we go through the panel because I want him to tell what happened to him later that day. It's really an extraordinary story. It tells you how different police methods are today as opposed to 1963. I think you'll be shocked. Some of you will. Others who are older won't be. Mr. Davis, uh, please give us your... Uh, your story. What did you see and hear in the motorcade and then on Air Force One? Well, let me first say I want you all to buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> did I give you a free one? Because I'm going to. If, if. Uh, and I want to apologize for my voice. I've been getting over laryngitis uh, from speaking, and that's just to my wife. <laughs> uh, the first impr I, I want to just say that I, I met John Kennedy in the 1960 campaign. He'd been a senator in Washington. I was a reporter who got there about 1959. <clears throat> I met him as a senator and knew he was very, very uh, lively, uh, a courageous guy, great <laughs> ideas, uh, glamorous in the sense of Hollywood. He was good looking, had a great war record. So it was a privilege to cover the campaign in 1960 with him. And I met him close up in 1960 in the campaign when we were in West Virginia. And he was having interviews about every 15 minutes covering the West Virginia primary. And my company, Westinghouse Broadcasting Company, and my boss and I uh, got one of the first interviews with him in his hotel room. And the thing that struck me about him was he, he was running from room to room. In, have, he'd have an interview down each hallway and have to do about four or five interviews in 25 minutes because everybody wanted to talk to him. The thing that struck me was he was in his jockey shorts, and he was he was he was almost I would call skinny. He looked like he might might be under 130 pounds at the time. He'd been wounded in the war. Uh, he did not have a back brace on, but he was favoring his back. He had a, a, a very serious back injury from being in the war. The next time I got close to him, of course, was when he became president. Uh, after he won the election, <coughs> excuse me, in 1960, I was assigned to the White House because I was familiar with the White House staff, and that's the way it worked. I knew everybody on the Kennedy staff, and it was advantageous for Westinghouse Broadcasting Company to have somebody covering the White House who knew everybody. And that's how I got with the Kennedy campaign. It was a, it was a great thing to cover. You had uh, two small children in the White House for the first time since Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, Jacqueline Kennedy goes beyond being glamorous, uh, being interesting, beautiful, a good mother, and uh, a very interesting person. And the two of them together uh, made a great photograph across the country, and they were very uh, aware of the fact that they were a glamorous couple, and that was a political asset. When we finally went to Texas during the 1963, this was the lead-up to the 1964 campaign, where Kennedy was going to run again with probably Johnson as his vice president, because they needed Johnson as they did in 1960 to win Texas. Johnson was very popular and powerful in Texas. And that was a way to shore up the fences uh, and get the two parties together in Texas because they were never together in the sense uh, I'm talking about the Democratic Party. I'm talking about conservatives and liberals. And uh, the war between conservatives and liberals in Texas has lasted longer than a Cold War. And it's not over yet. <laughs> but, 
But Kennedy was down at it to mend fences and try to get votes for the 1964 campaign. We went into Dallas with some trepidation because there had been a couple incidents in the uh, pre previous year or so. Uh, a congressman from Texas, uh, Bruce Alger, was a Republican conservative who uh, cornered with a group of people, cornered Mrs. Johnson and Vice President Johnson in a hotel lobby, and there was an altercation there because the Johnsons were too liberal or whatever. But it, was a, it was a political argument between conservatives and, Repub and, and uh, liberals. Another incident was Adlai Stevenson, the former UN ambassador, had visited uh, Dallas and a uh, crowd gathered around him that didn't like his policies on uh, coexistence with the Soviet Union. And by, by accident, a woman had a placard that hit Adlai Stevenson in the head. And that created a little bit of a furor, but nothing compared to what we thought would happen. There was some trepidation of people being opposed to President Kennedy, but nothing of a nature that uh, we're about to see. I was on press bus number one. The welcome in Fort Worth and previously in Houston and San Antonio couldn't have been warmer. The people couldn't have been nicer. And the same goes for Dallas and Fort Worth in the morning before we got to Dallas. In Dallas, the crowds were enormous. Uh, as uh, was pointed out to you, when Kennedy got off the plane, there was a large crowd at the airport to greet him. Mrs. Kennedy was wearing this uh, raspberry uh, two-piece wool suit, specially made for the occasion. I asked one of the women reporters, being not being a... Uh, uh, a fashion plate reporter, I asked one of the women reporters, how would I describe that dress? And she said, well, it's not a dress, it's a suit. And she said, don't call it pink, it's raspberry. <laughs> she said, Mrs. Kennedy would never be caught in pink. Uh, so I called it raspberry. And it was, uh, well, you see the pictures of her, you know what she looked like in that outfit. We got into the motorcade. Uh, it was very, very pleasant all the way into town. We had motorcycle cops all around us, except around the presidential limousine. President Kennedy had given orders, not only on that trip, but the previous trip to Tampa a week before, that he did not want the Secret Service riding on the side of the presidential limousine. There are footholds on, on the side of the limousine where the Secret Service can put their feet into it like saddles uh, or, or uh, uh, stirrups. And you can ride on it, and there's a handle for you to stand on. Kennedy didn't want any Secret Service agents around him. He wanted the crowd to see Mrs. Kennedy. In Tampa, on Friday before, he had admonished two Secret Ser Service agents rather uh, kindly and in a, sense, in, a, in a humorous way, would you stay off the side of the limousine? I want the crowd to see Mrs. Kennedy because that's how I get elected. <laughs> and, uh, and they did. When we got to Dallas, there were no policemen around the, 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 the limousine. When we left the uh, airport, went down to, uh, through town to Elm and Houston streets, the crowds could have been nicer, the signs were friendly and welcoming, there were people holding their children up to see the president. Uh, nothing could have been nicer. I was on press bus number one with 32 other White House correspondents uh, going into town. We were eight car lengths behind the presidential limousine. The uh, crowds got bigger and bigger as we got into town. We were coming up a Elm and Houston streets near where Mr. Fraser has told you he worked and somebody in the bus said what the hell is that and we said well it says school book depository what's that mean well someone from Texas had to explain what it was we never heard the expression before in the east and explained what it was and then we heard the shots we were eight eight car lengths behind the presidential limousine which is approximately uh, 90 or 93 feet something like that but the reason why we heard the shots so clearly was because we were just about under that sixth floor window. The presidential limousine was ahead of us by about 90 feet, and Oswald was shooting at an angle. So the shots, I think they even vibrated the windows on the bus. And one of my colleagues, Bob Pierpoint of CBS News, said, that's gunfire. And I recognized that it did sound worse than a firecracker. And by that time, we looked ahead and we saw the crowds dispersing. We saw the presidential limousine just take off. They were going to head to the nearest hospital, but the Secret Service always knows where the nearest hospital's, hospital is. No matter where they are, they all worked that all out. So they took off at a speed probably approaching 80 miles an hour. We, our bus, being a city bus, could not keep up with the presidential limousine or anything else. I saw the crowds dispersing. I saw parents. Uh, jumping and covering their children on the uh, what they call the grassy knoll at the Dealey Plaza. 
I saw a motorcycle policeman going up the knoll trying to chase whatever he thought. He thought the shots were coming from that direction. I saw him flip over and fall off his motorcycle. I saw another policeman on the ground pounding his fists in frustration. He was not able to uh, get going fast enough to catch whoever it was that they uh, thought the shots came from. Uh, our press bus took us to where the speech was going to take place because they didn't know where else to take us. We lost the limousine. They went to the trademark where the speech was going to take place. I got to a phone, called my office, and said shots had been fired under the motorcade. My boss had already seen a flash on the wire, says we know that. The president's in a place called Parkland Hospital. I dashed outside with my blue Olivetti typewriter. I waved it up in the air out in the middle of a freeway, and somebody, a gen gentleman, picked me up, and I remember it was a white convertible Cadillac. And they said, you want to go to Parkland Hospital? I said, yes, I do. And he said, I'll get you there. And we took off like a rocket and headed for Parkland. When I got to Parkland, the stretcher had just been re brought to the Kennedy limousine. I saw the limousine. They had just tried to clean it up a little bit. <clears throat> the stretcher had left for the emergency room door. Mrs. Kennedy was pulling the, the stretcher along with the hospital people, trying to get the stretcher inside. Clint Hill, her Secret Service agent, had just tried to finish, try to cleaning up the back seat. Hugh Sidey of Time Magazine, one of my friends, had seen it all happen. Before I got there, I went over to take a look, and he said, don't look, don't look down, it's horrible, meaning that he thought the president was mortally wounded and there was no, no hope for him. And I went inside, I got to a second floor, got to a telephone, and I started filing stories on what I saw, what the condition of the president was, at that point, they were working on the president. They were calling neurosurgeons all over the country who were experts in this area, saying, uh, we were told this. They're trying to get as much advice as they can to get a neurosurgeon who was the best in the country to get to Dallas as fast as they could. And meantime, I saw two priests talking to reporters about 10 feet from me. I ran over there. I was on the phone broadcasting live. I ran over, and I, just as I got there, Father Oscar Huber, he was a local parish priest, and I heard him say to my friends, these are all White House correspondents who had gathered, we had, somehow we'd all arrived at the same place on the second floor, and I heard the priest say, he's dead all right. I just gave him the last rites. And he paused, and he said, and I told Mrs. Kennedy that I think the, his soul had not left his body yet. I ran back to the phone, and I told my, my boss, a wonderful man named Jim Snyder, I said, do not put me on the air. I've got to talk to you. He took me off the air, and I said, Jim, there's a priest here who says the president's dead. What do we do? And he said, what do you think we ought to do? And I, was, and I hesitated. And we both decided we would not put it on the air. It was a moment of great dread. You know, your heart is pounding. The president of the United States is dead. You've known him for two years. You've watched him. You've been marveled at this guy, and he's gone. And you know the impact on the country, and you can't let your emotions get the head of you. You also want to get more definitive information, and you also want to be do the right thing. So we held it off the air. We did not put it on the air. We could have taken our bows and broken the story, I guess. But looking back, I think it was, it was the right decision. After the announcement was made, I was grabbed by a White House official, and they said, we need a pool immediately. And I said, I'm on the air live. I can't go. And he's pulling on my back of my coat from behind me. I said, I'm on the air. I can't leave. I said, damn it, I'm not going. He said, you've got to come with me. We need a pool. And he didn't tell me why. Dragged me off the phone, took me downstairs, back through the emergency room. I met two other reporters that were waiting downstairs. They told him to hold down there. Merriman Smith, the dean of the White House correspondents, one of the best reporters that ever lived. Uh, Merriman Smith of the United Press International. Chuck Roberts of Newsweek magazine. They took us to an unmarked police car. And we took off from the hospital. We asked where we were going. The cop said, I can't tell you where you're going right now. Just, just come with me. I said, will you call my office and tell them where we are? Can you radio headquarters and tell them where I am? They don't know where I am. <clears throat> he said, we're re maintaining radio silence because we don't know whether, this is, whether there are other shooters around. So we can't call, use the radios. We headed for Love Field at about 70 miles an hour, went over grassy lawns, over berms, everything else, going in and out of traffic, going the wrong way in several streets. Got to Love Field just as the casket and a, 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 the uh, hearse had arrived at Love Field with Mrs. Kennedy and the Secret Service, and the back, back stairway was down on Air Force One. I, uh, uh, let me take a sidestep here. Mrs. Kennedy wanted the, 
everyone to know that she wanted to leave Dallas as soon as she possibly could. She wanted to get the president back to Washington. He had now been pronounced dead. She knew that he was dead. And it was her, her main interest to get back to Washington. And the coroner in Dallas, or several coroners, I think, the way Dallas works, you may correct me on that, but I think there were several different people involved in that, in the uh, mortician's area of the police department, said, no, the law says you have to do the post in, in Dallas. Uh, there was an argument between the president's doctor and it was finally allowed to said that he could leave the hospital. So we get outside, they, they, the Secret Service gets outside. Meanwhile, I'm, I'm heading to the airport. The Secret Service now goes over to the hearse that's waiting to take the, uh, the body to uh, a local mortician for an autopsy. And there's a driver in there from O'Neill's funeral home. Now, the big burly Secret Service man named Andy Berger goes over to the driver and says, uh, where are we going? He said, well, we're going to the local morgue. There's one there. Apparently there's several places where they can do posts in, in, in Dallas. But we're going to go to one of these places to do an autopsy. And uh, Berger kind of gave a, s a signal. And he said, I think I'll drive. And uh, <laughs> so the gentleman, you know, that Secret Service under carrying a six-gun or whatever, you know, what do you know? The guy got out and gave the car to Andy Berger, who was a very skilled Secret Service driver. And uh, Andy Berger took off at about 70 miles an hour for Love Field. And the, that's when I arrived there, just about when she did, and they took the casket up the rear of the plane. Got into the airplane, and uh, it was sweltering hot. They'd been sitting under a hot sun, uh, uh, heating up all day long. It was, the, the temperature was tropical. It was out, 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 just horrible. And I went back to a compartment in the middle of the ship, and the, Lyndon Johnson, the vice president, was sitting there. Uh, with Mrs. Johnson and Kennedy staff people. The casket that was now brought into the airplane, they had to remove four seats on Air Force One in order to fit the casket in the rear. And as a matter of fact, the Secret Service had to knock off four handles on the casket to get it through the door at the rear of the airplane. And they had to do that in a hurry to get to do this. Meanwhile, they had to wait for the judge to com come from downtown Dallas. It did not take that long. There were other things that had to be done. Lyndon Johnson arrived at the, uh, air at the airport uh, about, I would say, 20 minutes to a half an hour before I did. First thing he went to is was his secretary, Marie Famer, and he asked her if she would make him a cup of hot vegetable soup or uh, chicken soup. He said, I've lived, I've lived a year since this morning. I remember her saying that to me. At the, at the swearing in now, Johnson asked uh, that room be made in the compartment for all Kennedy staff members that wanted to attend. He turned to Marie Framer, his uh, secretary, and said, would you ask Mrs. Kennedy if she would like to stand with us? Now, Mrs. Kennedy was in the rear of the plane, I would say 30 feet away from us, uh, sitting next to the casket with her, arm, with her hand on the casket. Marie went back and talked to Mrs. Kennedy, and she said, yes, I do want to attend, but I need a few minutes to compose myself. And after a few minutes, Mrs. Kennedy entered the compartment. There were 28, I counted 28 people in the, in the compartment. And Mrs. Kennedy came in, and uh, there was, you could hear the hum of one engine running to keep the air conditioning going in the airplane. And at this point, there was a huge outburst of sobbing and crying from the young people. And they were all young, and the Kennedy staff were just like he was. They were all young kids, 20 years, 23-year-old staff members, uh, uh, crying just uncontrollably. And I looked at the young girls that I knew, uh, their college graduates, uh, recent college graduates, and the Tears are going through the mascara on their cheeks. And this was the scene in that room. Johnson was as calm and resolved as he could be. Uh, he, when Mrs. Kennedy came to the doorway, he walked over to her, took her by both hands, and he walked her to the center of the compartment, placed Mrs. Johnson on his right. He asked Marie, his secretary, for a glass of ice water and told the judge to proceed, which she did. He took the oath, oath took 28 seconds. I clocked the oath at 28 seconds. And as soon as the oath ended, Lyndon Johnson said, his first order as president was, let's get airborne. And that, at that point, the, the colonel up front was uh, told to get going, revved up the other three engines. They told me that, and Mac uh, Kilduff, the pre assistant press secretary to the president, I'm cutting out some stuff, I want to save a little time. Matt Kilduff was the man who made the final, made the announcement before I had gone to the airfield. Matt Kilduff was assistant press secretary. He was not the, he was not the full-time press secretary. He was just an assistant. 
the full-time press secretary was on his mission to Asia and it was fell to Mac to handle this mammoth historical story. And he did a beautiful job. When he announced President Kennedy's death, he came into the room and you could see that he'd been crying. He opened his mouth and for about five seconds nothing came out. And he finally said, President John F. Kennedy died today at approximately one o'clock Central Standard Time here in Dallas. I have nothing further to say. At that point, all hell broke loose. We all charged for the telephones to file the story. But I have to admire what Matt Kilduff did. And uh, Kilduff was, was the one up front who told the pilot eventually to take off. There's some little dispute. One of the aides, Air Force aides to uh, President Kennedy was trying to keep the airplane on the, to get the airplane going. Lyndon Johnson wanted the airplane to stay there until the swearing in was finished. It took no, no additional time. It was a matter of minutes, a couple of minutes or so to get the oath taken in Dallas, and I can get into that part of it after some of these other people talk. Uh, one quick question. You heard the shots. How many? I heard three shots. Three. Three. Three just <coughs> distinct. They were just as clear as anything, and you could, there were seconds in between. I, was, I don't know. I've heard, I've read, I think it was six and a half seconds. Well, there's a dispute about seven, that. Somewhere seven between seven six and eight. Yeah, uh, I heard three distinct shots uh, yeah. sitting on the bus, yeah. and I was just I was below the, the sixth floor window. We 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 calculate that that bus when I was on. I'm not saying we were directly 190 degrees below, but I think we were we were within feet of being right below the window when the shots were fired. Mr. Davis, did you uh, were the shots spaced? Did it go boom, 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 or boom? Well, I, don't, I just, I, I, there was, there was space. No, I, I could hear it. No, I could hear the I heard three shots. I did hear three shots because we asked ourselves, we asked each of us on the bus, what, how many did you hear? And those of us who could hear uh, said it was three. We all agreed it was three shots. Now, we didn't know how many of them hit and what they were, and we, we weren't, were, we were positive. Pure Point was positive there was gunfire. He knew guns. We had several people on the, on, the, on the bus who knew guns. And they said, those are not backfires from motorcycles. Backfires are different from shots. I interviewed Bob Pierpoint before his death, and that's right. almost exactly yeah. what he said. Yeah. Now, can I interject yes. one thing that is often, often, often misinterpreted, misunderstood, and misused? They talk about three shots. But the clock doesn't start until after the number one shot has been <laughs> fired. You're only timing two shots. Yeah, I see. Right. Well, so you're right. You got, you got he was a sheriff. He knows. <clears throat> and that's my ruling. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell this guy's going to be good. <laughs> sheriff Bowles, go, go for it. Tell us your story. <clears throat> oh, you've got me following a hard act. That's like following kids or monkeys. Gee, <laughs> no offense, gentlemen. <laughs> My family is a traditional family. Most of the men wound up in law enforcement, and the ladies wound up nursing. My grandfather was a U.S. marshal in the Northern District of Texas at the turn of the century before he went to the state legislature as a representative from Collin County. My daddy was a police officer. I was a police officer. My wife is a nurse. My aunts were nurses. Our daughter did nursing. We're traditional. But I never had any idea, starting in 1951, that my hallmark assignment would be so heinous an offense as the killing of a president and the murder of a police officer. And an offense that still hasn't ended. We still have that cross to bear. It's a legacy that I, I don't think anyone would want. Uh, now they were also mentioning uh, buying their books. I won't ask anybody to buy my book because it turned out to be a flop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it did really. What it is, my, my claim to fame, if you want to call it that, what got me brought back in as the final investigator by Chief Birds assigning me to work with the House Assassination Subcommittee. I've never, by the way, been relieved of that. Now Birds dead. I don't know if I'll ever get off the hook. 
But I still get letters and phone calls regularly from people wanting to, to uh, challenge the, the assassination findings. I'm going to have to tell you if you don't hadn't figured it out. All these calls are not from people who believe that the truth has been told and that the Warren Commission was right. There's no future in, in saying that. All the futures have to be conspiracies. So that's all I spend my time now doing is answering why this wasn't a conspiracy. And you know what I found? It doesn't do a cotton picking bit of good to tell, explain them because they still don't believe me. So what the heck? I thought, however, at one time, after talking to a reporter from the New York, uh, the Los Angeles Times, he said, Chief, I want to tell you something. You need to put all your information down in a documentary. I got sad news for you. I said, well, what's that? He said, you ain't going to live forever. You're not going to live forever, and the world needs to have access to what you know. That's why I wrote the uh, book, the uh, FBI, the... Uh, I can't even remember the name of it. See, that's why it didn't sell. <laughs> well, I didn't. You got to keep it. mentioning the Kennedy half century. I I didn't sell it. I gave it to the <laughs> National Archives. Uh, the acoustics evidence, uh, the rebuttal to the acoustics evidence, Kennedy assassination, uh, rebuttal to the acoustics evidence, because I did rebut it, shot it down, killed it, knocked it off the front page, and put it to sleep. But here again, the, the world is hard to convince them that, not the world, only about 80%. And it's the world. I got inquiries from all over the country, all over the world. They just can't believe that such a heinous offense as the murder of a president and a police officer and it could happen at the hands of, of a nobody. An irresponsible nobody from nowhere who has done nothing and ain't going to. They just can't believe that a second nobody named Jack Ruby could slip in and, and wipe out Oswald. It just doesn't square so that there has to be a monkey in the woodpile somewhere. Well, we've looked and looked and looked, and you know what? There ain't no monkey nowhere. So I wrote this book. I said, now, I'm going to take the entire truth of what we know about the assassination, matrix that out, and then I'm going to lay in a conspiracy. I'm going to make Oswald, what they said, a patsy. He hollered, I'm a patsy, I'm a patsy. Well, what better lead could I ask for? So I wove a story around the assassination being a conspiracy, showed how to put, the only way you could put a group together that would have the, the wherewithal to organize something like that and the financial backing to support it because that don't come cheap. I put it all together and put it on the market and everybody who called me or wrote to me after that came out said, Sheriff, thank you for finally getting the truth out. The government wouldn't let y'all tell the truth about what happened in the Warren Commission. So now you've told what really happened and played like it's fiction and you snookered the government. Thank you. So the book, what few copies I got left in the cabinet in my, my office at home. <laughs> and, the, and I don't think Amazon.com is going to make a bunch of money off of it. The residuals. <laughs> but uh, I have made a career of rebuttal to the conspiracy. I know there are a lot of folks who think I'm nuts for that just as easily as I think they're nuts for believing in a conspiracy. But it doesn't make any difference. I don't care what they think. They don't care what I think. They're going to do what they want to do, and I'm going to do what's right. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell this guy got elected, right? <laughs> So, with with that, you know, I don't have an awful lot to say. I get, all I knew is joke, so I'll yield the rest of my time. And, what, and one quick question. I got Now, you knew the police department well, and I know there was scuttlebutt within the department. Who let Jack Ruby into that basement? Who and why? The Jack Ruby slipped into the basement because the officer who was working the Main Street entrance 
diverted his attention momentarily. Just it, it, all these things are coincidental, momentary deals, but it happens. Actually, it's factual. Sometimes goof ups happen. But the lieutenant had his car driven down into the underground, and he had to get his car out of there, and he was backing. So the officer stepped out into the street and stopped the traffic on Main Street, and he had to stop both lanes because he had to back across the lane because he wanted to go west. While he was putting his attention elsewhere for just that little old momentary period, Jack Ruby had left the Western Union coincidentally. And we say he coincidentally went there because you have to understand, Jack Ruby had these two little old dogs, and his one little dog he had was his absolute favorite. She was his... He, he sometimes referred to her as his wife. <laughs> That's, he, Sheba. Yep. He really loved that dog. And he had her in the car. He had gone down to the Western Union to wire a, a money order to one of his employees in Fort Worth. He had Sheba with him. He would never have taken that dog off and to a car <laughs> and had any idea that he would abandon that little doggie to the cruel, cruel world and go off to do something like killing somebody. Jack was an idiot, the highest order, but he wasn't that kind of guy where it came to something he really cared for, and he loved that dog. He would never have abandoned his dog to go off to commit murder. Uh, we feel firmly about that, that. He just happened to see this commotion as he passed by and took the opportunity to run down there and see what was happening. When he got there, he saw the, the crowd down in the basement. The officer turned his back to the to the driveway. Jack just walked down there. Happenstance. Coincidental, once in a million opportunity, but opportunities happen. Hey, you Chief, have can, I, can I ask one question? Go right ahead. Yeah, listen, after Sid Davis's wonderful account of that day, what we all picked up on was his, his comment, Sid's comment, that when he got to Parkland, they were cleaning out the car. That, perhaps, was the root of all the trouble. And, and you I know who know, cleaned wait, that car out? The Secret Service The did. Secret, Secret Service. Service did oh, wait, it. Now, that, that leads to my question to you. Oh. It seems to me that things like that, they are the things that have nourished all the confusion for 50 years since. If you'd been left alone at the Dallas Police Department and you investigated it from start to finish, do you think we would have a clean case? If we had been permitted to do what we had been trained to do and knew so well to do and did so well day after day, month after month, year after year, and that is police the city according to the laws of the state, we would have had Jack Ruby sidelined. We would have had Lee Oswald in prison. Interesting. We were not only managed... Really, the management was not the, the, the Secret Service. They, they had an, an interfering feature or factor, but it was kind of understandable. That cleaning out the limousine didn't really bother us that much. The thing that bothered us much was the northern media coming down here. And because... <laughs> no, no, please, let me... Give, give me a break. Give me a break. That's Virginia. Like Don't Mr. worry about Davis it. Virginia. Said, like Mr. Davis said... We had this, this deal with the uh, uh, conf confrontations, if you call them confrontations, before. And as he described the, the one when he, this lady, was accident, she got bumped and went over and bumped his head. Do you think the media is going to let, when they are after Dallas as high as the, conspiracy, the uh, conservative capital of the world, and we don't like conservative politics. They're not going to let that bump on the head be an accident. They blasted it all over the media that he was assaulted by a conservative fanatic in Dallas. The media, uh, I'm not going to mention any names, mainly because some of, most of them are dead, including that nice lady. But she sat in her hotel room at the Statler Hilton Hotel and sent out copy after copy after copy saying exactly what happened and never left her room or put her bottle down. <laughs> uh, I'm so glad you didn't mention Larry, her name. 
<laughs> you know I didn't do Larry. that. She'd come back from the grave and haunt me. Larry. But Larry. in the process of doing Larry. it, it's the media. Larry. I'd like to interject something here <coughs> yep. uh, the, uh, about the cleaning up of the car. It is congenital for the Secret Service to protect the reputation and the President of the United States. And I think Clint Hill, who was Mrs. Kennedy's agent, and of course he covered the President as well, I think they were thinking in terms of protecting the image of the President. They didn't want the public, they didn't want that car to be seen with uh, brain matter, uh, parts of the skull, Shards the blood, the skull. blood Mr. Everywhere. Davis, let me public. pick up there and carry that right on down the line to the next level. The autopsy. Yes, our state law said clearly it's a, there's no crime murdering a president. There is a crime of murder against the peace and dignity of the state of Texas. Sure. This was a Texas trial, and it required our processing, and we were diligently ready to do it. On the other hand, there's a common sense factor. Who in the Sam Hill at a time like this is going to start a piddling war over a technicality like this? Because here's Jackie Kennedy saying, I want to get out of Dallas. Here's the president saying, just get airborne. You know what? There's such a thing as being a little bit vested with common sense, and the law would support a judge authorizing the, the, the uh, autopsy elsewhere. The problem comes from the fact, who's going to do the autopsy? Professional autopsy surgeons who are d trained in doing medical legals are people who are medical doctors in the military of the United States whose careers depend upon not offending the first family. They take pictures of Blackley of the head so it doesn't look so awful and it doesn't look like the same shot that we saw the president have. It is confused for history because they did not know how to take a correct medical legal for evidentiary purposes. They were career oriented and they were also, and I don't fault them for this because I would have probably done the same. They were concerned for the hierarchy they immediately served. They worked for the President of the United States and they were looking after the, his best interest and who can blame them for that? We lost a little bit of a case, but at the same time, we gained a little dignity, maybe. I don't know if the little dignity is worth the case, but the whole thing turns around on the autopsy. It was a botched autopsy that would not have done very much in the way of telling the, the world the truth of what happened uh, in, yep. in, in the now, assassination. Mr. Bowles is absolutely correct. By the way, just to inform the younger people, in believe it or not, in 1963, the murder of a president was was not a federal offense, so the laws of Texas actually applied in that case, and the the local coroner was absolutely correct in trying to stop the casket so that the autopsy could be performed there. Uh, one other comment on uh, what what Mr. Davis and others were saying, and what Mr. Hurt said, uh, I, I'm sure Mr. Davis is correct, and I've talked actually to a couple of the Secret Service people. And I think your theory is, is absolutely accurate. They were trying to clean it up before news photographers got over and took photos. And there are actually photos right. of this horrible pool of blood and all the splatter. The problem is it was a crime scene. <laughs> it's a crime scene. And you can actually tell things from the, uh, it's just awful to say it, and I apologize, but from the splatter, you can tell certain things about the direction of the bullet and so on. And unfortunately, we lost all of that because Secret Service agents had a, had a bucket and, and claws and we're cleaning up the car before anybody really got a chance to examine it. Now, let me go to uh, Jefferson Morley and then to uh, Henry Hurt and then we're going to go to your question. Well, I've got one other <laughs> surprise for you and then we're going to go to your questions. Jeff? Thank you, Larry. Um, I'm very honored and humbled to be here, um, especially with these men who were participants in the event. Um, my story is less dramatic. I was in kindergarten in St. Louis. <laughs> a, a, te a teacher burst into the room in tears. Uh, I'd never seen a grown-up crying before. Um, and that was the beginning of what I later learned was the assassination of President Kennedy. Um, it was a formative memory for me. It was really my first public memory of something that had happened outside of my immediate family um, and uh, always endured as something that I was interested in. Um, 
I started reading books about the Kennedy assassination in the 1980s at, uh, when I was starting out as a journalist and um, was always kind of curious about them. Um, I was struck that none of them struck me as very good. Um, uh, and so I really did not know what to make about the assassination story at all. Um, and uh, uh, was interested in it kind of in an American studies type of way, why this incident had so much impact on our culture. I wasn't really, or didn't really try to figure out who was behind the crime until 1992 when Oliver Stone's movie came out. And I just started working at the Washington Post that year. And uh, there was many a dinner party in Washington that was ruined that year by arguments over Oliver Stone's movie. And the passions that it provoked and the strong points of view that people who I felt on both sides were very intelligent and very well informed was really amazing to me. And, um, but I despaired as a journalist. I, I felt I had nothing to add to the story, really. Um, I, uh, 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 when I would think, you know, how could I talk about what happened in Dallas compared to, you know, the people who were there? What could I possibly say that would be as interesting or as well informed as they would? And so I, I, I stayed away from it. But after Oliver Stone's movie was made, Congress passed a law in the result of all this furor. And Congress said, well, uh, you know, people s accuse Stone. They said, you know, you're making things up. You, you mistwisted the record. You've done a lot of bad things. And that was true. He was a movie maker and he had, you know, adapted the record to make a better movie. But he responded with a line that was very telling, which was, if the government doesn't have anything to hide, why are they hiding so many things? And this, I, when I saw this, I really woke up. And he talked about how many pages of records related to Kennedy assassination were still classified. And this is in 1992, so this is 29 years after the fact. And it was amazing. It was literally millions of pages of documents. And so Congress passed this law and they created an entity to oversee uh, the declassification of all of these records. Um, and that was an organization called the Assassination Records Review Board. And as I saw the law getting into effect and I started to talk to people who were on the board, I realized finally what we would have is we would have new information. And we didn't have to write about the old theories. I could write about the new information that was coming on to the, into the public record and a lot was going to come. So I started paying attention to that process and figuring out what would be interesting to talk about. I also decided early on that I was sick of the arguments and the, the arguments were so fierce and so pointless that I decided when I talked about the assassination, um, I wouldn't have a theory. And if you look at, if you Google my name and look, I've been reporting on the Kennedy assassination for 30 years. I've never endorsed a theory of the assassination. I don't have a theory um, and I wasn't really interested in them. I was interested in saying things that were indisputably true, not theories, facts. And people could make of those facts what they will. And so that's been what I've tried to do over the years since then is report new facts. And I really have focused on one area in particular, uh, which is a, kind of a, 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 la a layer removed from the crime scene in Dallas. And that was what did US law enforcement and intelligence agencies know about Oswald as he made his way to Dallas? Because we could argue about was November 22nd the work of a lone sociopath or was it the work of a conspiracy? and we would disagree, but if we said the president getting killed in broad daylight is an intelligence failure, everybody can agree with that. So how do we explain the intelligence failure that culminated in Dealey Plaza? And that's really what I've tried to focus on in the course of my work. I think I can talk about it in the context of what uh, these other men have said. I Just to comment on what I think are the interesting points and what they've said so far. Um, Buell describes, I think, in, in, in nice detail, somebody who knew Oswald and didn't know him well, but knew him fairly well, and especially at the time of the assassination. And I think what you see from Buell's description rings true with what I've learned about the assassination as well. Is Lee Harvey Oswald does not, was not a sociopath. He was not clinically mentally ill. Um, he was not uh, a dissociated personality that we see in other people who have attempted to shoot the president. You think of a John Hinckley or Mark Chapman who shot John Lennon um, or Squeaky Fromm who sought to, to shoot President Ford. They were lone nuts. Okay? Lee Harvey Oswald was not that. He was married. He was, had friends. He was played with children. Um, he had taught himself Russian. He was, not a, he was not a sociopath, and I think that's what I take away from, 
from Buell's story there. Um, Sid's story reminds me of Merriman Smith. It was Merriman Smith, the first UPI reporter, gets to the phone in Parkland and he coins the term the grassy knoll in his first dispatch for UPI. And he said the president was struck by gunfire and they seemed to come from the grassy knoll in front of the presidential motorcade. And so you have observers on the scene, trained observers, and uh, like Merriman Smith, saying they thought gunfire came from in front of the motorcade. And I think that's worth noting. Um, Sheriff Bowles here account, I think, is, is in incredibly um, persuasive and informed by the reality of Dallas at that time. Um, I would say that uh, I would differ with his description of those events uh, involving um, Adley Stevenson, for example. Uh, that was not blown out of proportion. Adley Stevenson was at the center of a roiling mob of people who were shouting at him. And it was a very scary and unprecedented situation for a senior U.S. government official to be in. I know people in Dallas might think that Northerners were overreacting to that, but I think for people who were not from Dallas, that was extraordinary behavior, and that accounts for why people were nervous about the president going to Dallas. Um, I think I'll stop there because I think it would be more useful to hear people's questions. Yeah, I want, a little bit later, once we get questions, I do want you to tell them the kinds of things you've learned about the CIA. The, you, you've just uncovered some extraordinary memos. Not saying that you know the CIA had a special unit, you know, and assassinated the president. Uh, you know, if you choose to believe that, fine. But uh, the memos you've uncovered, I think, are are really revealing. Uh, just tell them about the one about the mature maturing. I just want them to know about that. Yeah, I think. You know, um, at the time Oliver Stone's movie came out, there was a lot of speculation. Oswald was a CIA agent. He had been an FBI informant. There was a lot of that kind of talk, and nobody really knew. What we've learned from the mass of information that has emerged since then was um, Lee Harvey Oswald, for all his ordinariness and his obscurity, was a man who was very well known to senior CIA officials in October of 1963. And Larry's referring to a cable that was not fully declassified until 2001. Um, just the, the back story is in October of, of 1963, Oswald went to Mexico City um, and paid a visit to the Cuban consulate there and the Russian <coughs> embassy. And he told them that he wanted to get a visa and he wanted to travel to Havana and then he, wa he was going to go back to the, to the Soviet Union. And so. Uh, the Cubans said, well, uh, if you're going to do that, you've got to get your visa to the Soviet, from the Soviets. And so Oswald went from the Cuban consulate to the Russian embassy and said he wanted to go. And they said, um, we can't do that here. You have to apply in Washington. It's going to take four or five <coughs> months. So basically, you can forget about going to, to Havana and Moscow. And so um, Oswald left. Well, the CIA had the entrances to the two embassies very well covered with photographic surveillance focusing on the entrance and taking pictures of everybody who came and went. They also had the phones tapped so they could coordinate between the pictures and the phone calls who was coming and going. And in one of the phone calls, the caller identified himself as Oswald. The CIA surveillance team uh, sent the, transcribed that, sent it to the CIA station, which was in the U.S. Embassy in Mexico. and. Uh, they wrote a, a, a memo to, to Langley and they said, there's this guy Oswald here in Mexico City, Lee Oswald, who is he? And so the cable goes to uh, CIA headquarters and this query about the very obscure visitor to the, to, the, to the Russian embassy in Mexico is routed to one of the most secretive parts of the CIA, the counterintelligence staff. And what we now know is that Oswald was watched very carefully by the counterintelligence staff for four years, from October 1959 to November 1963. And when I say very closely, I mean they probably received between 40 and 50 different pieces of paper about him. CIA cables, they, inter they intercepted his mother's correspondence to the State Department, FBI reports on him when Oswald came back, he was interviewed by the FBI. All of those reports were funneled to the CIA and read and held in the counterintelligence staff of the CIA. This is when Oswald is totally unknown. Um, and so on October 10th, the counterintelligence staff gets together and they respond to 1963. the 1963. 63. Just a little before the assassination. They, seven weeks before the assassination. And they get together and they respond to Mexico City and they send a cable to 
the station chief of Mexico City. And I'm going to pause here for my own Good. plug. <laughs> Wynne Scott, this is a biography of Wynne Scott that I wrote, a <coughs> man in Mexico, was the chief of the station in Mexico City. And so he has sent the cable to Washington, who is this guy Oswald? And the response is coming back from the counterintelligence staff. They open up the Oswald file. Oh, he lived in the Soviet Union. He married this Russian woman. He came back. Um, and so Scott wants to know what's going on with him. And they write this cable. It's about four pages, and you, and you can get it online now. Um, and the, the, the cable winds up by saying, um, uh, our latest information on Oswald is that his time in the Soviet Union has had a maturing effect on him. Okay. That's the message that goes back to Lynn Scott. Lynn Scott was very curious about who this American was uh, who was trying to, to do this trip. Um, but the CIA really didn't offer any more information about him. In fact, they offered this somewhat reassuring words. This guy's lived in the Soviet Union. He used to be a communist. But now he's maturing. Okay? And this is on paper. And 42 days later, the president is killed. Lee Oswald is arrested. And that piece of paper, that cable, written on October 10th, becomes radioactive. Nobody in the CIA wants that cable to come out. And it doesn't come out for 30 years, uh, uh, 40 years. It comes, out, it comes out in 2001 is when it's finally declassified. And the reason they don't want it to come out is because the signatories to that cable were five senior CIA officials. And here were their job descriptions. So these are not clerks who are paying attention to the thoroughly obscure Oswald. These are the top undercover officers in the CIA. The chief of, he of operations in the Western Hemisphere, a man named Bill Hood. Jane Roman was the ch chief aide to the head of the counterintelligence staff. She had filed the first report on Oswald in October 1963. So Jane Roman had been reading about Oswald for four years. Um, there was another man, John Witten. He was the chief of the Mexico desk in the clandestine service. He oversaw covert operations in Mexico City. So uh, Ann Edgeter was the woman who controlled the access to the Oswald file in the CIA staff. These people had signed off on the notion that Oswald was maturing 42 days before Kennedy was killed. So after Kennedy was killed, this is a small but telling example of the problem that the CIA faced, which was they had known all about the accused assassin for four years. And we learn later that they have very stri striking experience. One, John Witten was one of those senior CIA officials. He's sitting in the clandestine service, second floor of the CIA offices, on the afternoon of November 22nd. The president's been killed. Everybody's turned on their radio. And the name Oswald comes over. And Witten said when Oswald's name was broadcast, and this is a direct quote, he said, the effect was electric. Okay. The name Oswald was not unknown at the CIA on November 22nd. To the contrary, it was very well known. And when people heard it and heard that this guy had killed the president, the effect was electric. They understood that the CIA had a big problem. And we have been dealing with that problem really ever since. I'll talk a little bit later about the secrecy that still surrounds CIA records on the assassination. That's the part of the story that I know best. Mr. Morley, can I ask you a question? On sure. That? <coughs> You keep referring to the CIA was looking into Oswald, but were they doing it in concert with Oswald or as an aside to Oswald? Because their technique, their technique most often is they don't let a possible person who might be of use to them know that they're being looked at until after they have made a thorough investigation and a conclusive investigation and decided now we will open the door to him. Oswald could have been looked at all those four years and never been touched by them, never been talked to by them. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, my point is not that uh, they were running Oswald as an agent or attempting to use him or re recruit him or enlist him. Well, because he came from Russia and was a defector and showed a certain moxie <clears throat> for this, would have been a basis for attracting their attention. Absolutely. And good Absolutely. Because they're always in search of possible aid. By the way, to show you have people in search of people for certain positions, a little aside for humor's sake. I can't avoid humor. It's a spice <laughs> like I got a call from Oliver Stone to meet him at the Stone Hotel. He wanted to hire me. 
as a technical advisor for his movie. I said, well, I'm honored. Uh, I got, I'll have to ask you a question first. He says, what's that? I said, do you plan to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, or are you going to make a fool out of history? <laughs> he says, thank you for coming by. I don't think we're going <laughs> to. <laughs> that is a great story. I'm glad you told it. But, but just one P.S. to what uh, Jeff has just told you. Under the Records Act, we hope by October 26th of 2017, we'll have the, what, 1,171 CIA documents directly relating to the Kennedy assassination, accounting for thousands and thousands of pages, uh, released unless the next president agrees that it is still in our national security interest that they not be released or that they be redacted. So remember that when you're considering presidential candidates the next time. <laughs> Finally. Henry, Henry Hurt, and I want you, first of all, you know, reasonable doubt. Go ahead and hold it up. Right. It was a bestseller anyway. Most of you have it. Uh, but um, I want you to clear all this up for us, solve the problem, right. so we get to questions. Go. You know, I'm bound to say this, though. <laughs> That's a wonderful account you give. The fact the CIA was watching Oswald and keeping up with him, but in case you don't know it, it's well documented that the FBI had followed him as close or even more closely. So it wasn't just the CIA that we are now learning about, <coughs> thanks to Jeff Morley, but the FBI had been on him for years. So um, let's see. I was, I was not in kindergarten when I heard about, <laughs> about the assassination. First grade, second grade, <laughs> what was it? No, no actually. I was uh, probably about 24, something like that. But anyway, my introduction to Oswald came when I was working as a researcher for a man named Edward J. Epstein. And Epstein was writing a book called Legend, and it was about Lee Harvey Oswald and his intelligence connections. One thing we knew about Oswald was that he'd been, been in the Marine Corps. We had a list of about 70 people, men, that Oswald had served with. My job was to go out and find 70 U.S. Marines who had served with Oswald. And I think I found about 40, and that's a lot. And I would even say to you that I probably know, you know, Wesley Frazier knew Oswald, he rode in the car with him, he knew him that way. I didn't have that. What I do know, though, is that there's probably nobody else left in the face of the earth who dealt with more people who knew Oswald than I did, <laughs> because I interviewed all those Marines who, who knew him. And the, and the picture that emerged was not unlike what uh, Mr. Fraser has told us, but I, I will tell you one thing, one, and, and, and I found these guys all over the United States, and um, it, it was great fun doing it, I admit that. But one of the recurring things that these Marines would tell me, of course they hadn't talked to each other in, in years, was they would say, well, you know one thing I remember about Oswald? And they would lower their voices. They'd say, whenever he got mail, at mail call, he would take his letter off by himself to read it. <coughs> well, I thought to myself, that's what I would do too. <laughs> so so um, anyway, that was my introduction to, to Lee Harvey Oswald. And then, you know, in this business of journalism, one thing leads to another. And, um, and I did a, a book on the FBI and the CIA on what they did to a man <clears throat> to a man named Nick Shadron. And man, that's a whole other story. And I won't get into that here. You could only push one book at a time <laughs> on this panel. You gotta pick one. But but I'm trying to rope in since Larry wants me to uh, say Soul something about right. Easterling. <laughs> the way Easterling comes into it, I was on a, a TV program, the T Today Show talking about the book on Nick Shadron. And 
as we completed the, and Tom Brokaw was doing the interview. It was a very complicated book. It was a very, uh, uh, very challenging thing to talk about espionage at, <clears throat> at 8 a.m. On, on the Today Show. As I left there, somebody in the, at the Rockefeller Center came up and said, Mr. Hurt, you have a phone call. And I took the phone call, and it was this guy, Easterling, who said, I helped kill the president. I was played a, played a role. Now, what you have to remember is, at this time, nobody, and, and, and you guys can tell me if I'm wrong, but nobody had ever come forward and said that they were involved in the assassination. There were still people coming forward to admit that they were in on the Lincoln assassination. <laughs> but <laughs> nobody at that point had done that. So I didn't hang up on him. I said, well, you know, let's, uh, I'll call you back and we'll talk about it. So he had this involved story that, that Larry has, has mentioned about Manuel and the, 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 the magic bullets and how the magic bullet was created, all this stuff. So what I tried to do, I said, okay, I'll talk to the guy until I can prove everything that he says is wrong. Or, you know, just admit, dismiss him totally. And here we get into the whole matter of a case that is so riddled with confusion, so riddled. I mean, the, the reason Jim Garrison could have his day in the sun is because nobody knew what happened. And there were all these conflicting stories. And so anyway, that started me down the road with... Uh, um, on what came to be the book Reasonable Doubt. And one of the things I kept looking for was, was the, the something that would show, like take the magic bullet. The magic bullet just doesn't make any sense. If, I think most, many of you have seen pictures, pictures of the bullet that went through Kennedy, it went through Conley, it went through Conley's great big wrist, and it emerged in pristine condition. It's Commission Exhibit 399 that the, uh, that the Warren Commission has. Well, you know, that just doesn't make any sense because then you look at bullets that were shot through. Uh, one was shot through a human cadaver. One was shot through a goat's head. And the bullets come out shattered. So in a case as confused as this <laughs> where there's so much conflict where n nearly, you know, usually you shy away from anecdotal evidence, but here that's what we're dealing with. So I decided to, 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 to try something with the magic bullet. So I bought a rifle exactly like Oswald's, same vintage, same everything. Just, in fact, the serial numbers were not that far off. And I took a 50-gallon barrel of water. And me and my two sons went out and fired the Mandlicker Carcano using vintage ammunition. The very bullets that, in fact, I brought. <laughs> the very bullets that Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, uh, that he used for, for his Mandlicker Carcano. So what comes out when you shoot, the, when you shoot it into a barrel? You get the magic bullet. It's pristine. There's nothing, there's a slight, slight change in, you know, in, in the bullet itself. But it looks exactly like the magic bullet. So anyway, this doesn't prove anything whatsoever, except that I do think, <laughs> except I do think no one has ever explained, and maybe someone here can, how that bullet could do that much damage to two human bodies and emerge in pristine condition. Nobody's ever made that happen, shooting through cadavers, goats, everything. Shooting a barrel of water, it does happen. Then, of course, as you know, the magic bullet is called that because it ended up on a stretcher in Parkland Hospital. Nobody knew where it came from. I it <laughs> <laughs> okay. Finally, we've made news. <laughs> Now we know. Now we know. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So, well, I've been accused of a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, somebody put it there. <laughs> That's great. And, 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 and that bullet ties right up with, with uh, Oswald's rifle. So anyway, my book is a little bit like Larry's. It's not trying to promote a particular theory, but, but there's so many unanswered questions, and we deserve better. We deserve so much better as a nation. And, and after, I think the Kennedy assassination was the real turning point. We were duped. The press was duped. Everybody was duped. Sold a bill of goods. And then it took about 10 years for the press to really wake up. When it came to Vietnam, the press was, 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 was waking up pretty good. It came to Watergate. The press was wide awake. And it's been wide awake ever since. And that's good. That's good. And Larry's book is trying to... Can I promote your book? Uh, I, I'm hesitant to let you, but go ahead. Go ahead. Sure. And, of course, Larry, with his tremendous resources and his skills, has produced something that is a greater compendium. You even, don't have the cover on even, there. Even than my book. <laughs> but as far as... And then I, I would love to hear the chief talk about tip it a little bit. Of course, he was a fine police officer. But really, if the evidence against Oswald on killing Tippett had ever gotten to a court, well, they would throw out Ms. Markham, right? And, and where did the thing come from on your police tapes where somebody inserts, or tell me if I'm wrong, the thing that says, Officer Tippett, go to Central Oak Cliff. That wasn't there at first, and now it's there. Well, it was there all the time that I listened to it. So I don't know what tapes you listen to. I listen to the original. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me give you one little thought, though, yes. to start with on the magic bullet. This is from Governor Connolly personally. From what? Governor Connolly, the recipient of the magic bullet. The victim of it. Yeah. He received it. He lived with it. He reminded me, he says, I was, first off, look, I was born and raised on the Texas Highlands. I was born with a rifle in my hand. I hunted on the, the, the plains out there with, all my life. I, I know what bullets sound like, rifles sound like, because when you're out there, there's a bunch of people shooting the same things you are. You don't know whether they're going to shoot you or, the, or what the, the original target was. Also, don't forget, I had military time. He said, I heard the first shot. I started to look to my left and realized the sound came from my right, and I started to turn. This is confirmed in the, the Zapruder movie. And he says, then I felt this awesome pressure and searing fire pressing me down and burning, and I knew then, oh, God. I've been hit. He didn't hear the bullet. Remember, a bullet travels supersonic. You cannot. There is no person in this world can hear a supersonic bullet coming at him. It gets there before the sound does. So what Connolly told me was unimpeachable. It, it was chapter and verse. That first shot missed their target. The second shot hit. It hit the president and it hit Conley. And I don't give a continental whether it's plausible to believe that it got through without hitting a bone, but that by dang and all is holy it did. Because well, it's there. That's right. Well if it did it it had to it had to <coughs> Well, it's, it's a <laughs> certainly a lot better than that, that pathologist idiot up there in the north that says, it went this way and stopped and turned and went that way and went down and turned and went this <laughs> hey, way and turned. And hey, Sheriff, where did Conley say that first shot came from? It came from his right rear. Right, right rear? Yes, because he said he started to look to the left and realized it came from the other side and he was turning toward his right and looking to the rear. And that is confirmed in... The, the Pruder film. Yeah, so if I could just interject one thing, but Connolly and Nellie Connolly were quite explicit. The president was hit by the first bullet, and I was hit <coughs> by the second bullet. 
When John Connolly was asked to endorse the single bullet theory, he said, that's wrong. The first bullet hit President Kennedy, and the second bullet hit me. He and people have. said, well, Governor Connolly, you know, if that's true, then the single bullet theory is wrong. And Connolly said, I don't care. President Kennedy was hit by the first bullet, and I was hit by the second bullet. And so that's, that was his testimony. And just to add one thing, I interviewed Mrs. Connolly, Nellie Connolly, before she passed away at the LBJ Library. This was during the 1990s. And she insisted that both her husband, who had already passed away, uh, and herself believed that President Kennedy was hit by a separate bullet from John Connolly. Now, who knows? I mean, these things are happening in microseconds. So, who can say for sure? But after all, they were there. They were in the car, and you know, one of them was hit. And she did insist to me that that was the case. You know, that's all I can say. But we're not going to resolve it here. I wish we could. I want to look. Here, here's where, where we're going to go because we're running out of time, and we've got to get to a few questions. But right before we do, I want to show you something that I think uh, you will be very, very interested in because we have a, another special guest who has flown in to, to be with us. And I want you to see, this is very brief, a little piece of historic footage from November 22nd. Most people don't know this exists or they haven't seen it unless you studied the subject. That also shows the fatal bullet hitting President Kennedy in the head. And it was taken by Orville Nix. It is the Orville Nix film. It's not nearly as famous as the Zapruder film, but it's extremely useful because it was taken from the other side opposite Zapruder and you can kind of piece the two together and get a better sense of what happened, the directions, etc. Well, uh, Mr. Nix passed away in 1972, but we're delighted to be joined tonight by his granddaughter, Gail Nix Jackson. Gail, please stand and accept our warm wishes for, for coming. And I believe your husband is with us too. Introduce him. Please. Just, Am I on? You're on, absolutely. Okay. Do you mind if I sit down? I've had oh, absolutely. Three. Okay. Feel free. You've traveled a long way. Oh, no, no. I'm, I'm, I've had three auto accidents and have a bad back. Oh, three. well. That's yeah, not my driving. You know those Texans. Yeah. It's that Texas driver. <laughs> <laughs> I would first like to thank Dr. Sabato. Oh, my goodness. I have to tell you all, and I'm sorry. I'm, I'm going to try and not take up too much time, but as, you, as Mr. Bowles has showed you, we like to talk in Texas. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> let me explain to all of y'all how wonderful Mr. Savado. Y'all already know Dr. Savado. No, let me. Please let me. Please don't do that. Please. All right. Well, okay. go ahead. <laughs> I'll go on. <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> Several months ago, a woman contacted me and said, "Aren't you? Aren't you the granddaughter of Orville Nix?" And I said, "Well, yes." She said, "Why have you never written his story?" I said, well, I like to create a bright, and I mean, I'm not really good at this technical stuff, and there are so many wackos in this thing. I, I don't want to be another one, you know? She said, well, if you're not going to do it, I am. And I'm like, oh, no, no, no. I, I went back and I'm going to do it. And the reason I got a hold of Dr. Sabato is because I saw his nobility, and I think that y'all would agree with me, his benevolence. And, and no, I'm serious. I, I really mean it. I like everything you're saying. Okay. Really. And in offering this course on JFK, because you know what? I've got kids. <coughs> I've got kids who are going to have grandkids. Someone needs to tell the truth. We're, we're going to have to find the truth out about this, and I really would like for it to happen before I die. I, I really would. But in offering this course, in offering everything that he's doing, he is enlightening. He is showing through research, through studies about what really happened. And, and that's where we go, get to me. I said, <laughs> I emailed him and I said, my name's Gail Nix Jackson. I've been looking for my grandfather's film since 1978. Yeah, there it is. But that's not the original. The government, UPI, the powers that be have lost his original film. How can that be? Like Mr. Hurt said, like Mr. Bowles said, 
Coincidences, please. This many coincidences, really, really. They took his film, the FBI did, for over a week. The Zapruder film they had overnight. They took his camera for five months and sent it back in pieces. They didn't, the Zapruder camera is, well, it's now at the Six Four Museum. Didn't happen that way. Why? All these inconsistencies. Too many questions. Too many. So I asked Dr. Savado, I said, okay, could you please help me? When you're, when, during your course, would you let people know, I am looking for this film. I've been looking for it forever. I believe that we will find it. I don't want to prove Oswald did it. I don't want to prove that he didn't. I just want to find the film and let someone prove and let us get answers to the truth. Because isn't that what we really want is the truth. Aren't we owed that by our government and by, I mean, aren't we? Can I get an yeah. amen someone? <laughs> so, Virginians are not very expressive. Oh, okay. <laughs> They're very unlike Texans. I just think that we're owed and I am looking and if anybody would like to try and help me find it, I... We, we want to help you, and that's why that's one of the reasons we have you here. We're going to advertise it using and the I am boards. A book. And okay, I am writing a book, but it's not. It's to find my grandfather's film. It's to tell what people don't know about this one. You see that? You see what we're watching right there? My grandfather didn't even realize he had taken the the film. He didn't. <laughs> he was very frugal. He had a fourth grade education. He looked down at the viewfinder on the Keystone, and he said, "Oh." It started at 25, now it's at 23. I must not have taken it. Well, you know what? He was running through the plaza, white-knuckled, gripping his keystone, and filming, and he didn't realize it. So he went back the next morning, trying to recollect get his memory about what he had seen, took more pictures, and then realizing he still had film left, didn't want to lose it, went to my aunt's, future aunt's, um, drill team, and took those pictures. And then, uh, I mean, he, he didn't want to gripe. He didn't want my grandmother griping at him for asking for more money for film. So he used all that he had. But anyway, they took it to Dinah Color. FBI had I issued an edict saying any films that come through, they have to be turned over to us immediately. Dinah Color called the FBI. Then they called my grandfather, and he watched it on a wall, like a white wall, like that, in the middle of the night. And the FBI took it. And then he got it back. I mean, he got it back. He did, but that's how it went. And the evidence, how it was treated so differently. I, there's just so many questions, y'all. And then it disappeared with and the House Select Committee on Assassinations yes. Yes. in the 1970s. Remember, somebody might have taken a souvenir. Exactly. Exactly. I can also see that happening. It was a very big staff. Right. Uh, but anyway, we, we want to find it. And, Gail, yeah, we, we appreciate it. I just want to say to the audience, uh, of course, we have an honor code here at the University of Virginia. So if any of you have that film, I expect you to turn it over. And Gail is here tonight. And if we, get, we don't get it from this crowd, we'll keep moving, Gail. Now, look, we have had a, a just, I wish we had uh, hours more to hear from them. And I suspect, though, that many of you have questions that you want to ask them. And the remaining time we've got to use for your questions. I've got two mics here, and uh, this is your chance. It's probably the only chance you'll ever have to ask people who have thoroughly researched it or were there on November 22nd, 1963. Yes, sir. Uh, is that on? I don't think no. it is. Well, we can hear him. We can hear you. We can hear you. Glenn Crossman's coming to the rescue. Thank you. In terms of Kennedy's legacy, I'd just like to point out the possible correlation between two events, major events. One is within months of Kennedy being uh, taking office, the doomed invasion of Cuba. And to this day, we have not invaded Cuba. Kennedy took the fall for that, is my, is my opinion. And there's been a lot of research on that. There's, you know, there's a book two years ago, Brilliant Disaster. And then the other, the, other, the other event is just weeks before the Kennedy assassination was a treaty signed by the United States and Russia that limited the testing of weapons of mass destruction. And within weeks of signing that, that treaty, Kennedy was dead. Well, that's James Douglas's theory, of course, as well. And his, 
in his book about the Kennedy assassination. We certainly have pushed a lot of books here tonight, haven't we, as a, as a group. You know, the, let me focus on the Cuba part of it in particular because that's one place where all of us here would agree that the CIA did not tell the truth to the Warren Commission. Uh, clearly, you know, just didn't tell the truth about the murder incorporated going on and all the assassination attempts on Castro, which after all could have been a motive for Castro or someone associated with him to strike back at Kennedy. And Castro even said something like that a month or two, I think, before the assassination. If American leaders are trying to eliminate the leaders of other countries, they themselves should not feel safe. Well, that's, you know, kind of an indication that something might happen. Uh, do you have an opinion on the Cuban connection? Can, yeah. pro, pro and anti Castro. I would say I would I would say this on the uh, Cuban connection. I don't doubt that there are people who were angry with Kennedy for trying to uh, invade Cuba, and they may have influenced. I don't see how they could have influenced Oswald as, as, well as possible. But uh, the CIA not only lied to other people, but the CIA did not level with Kennedy on the results of the Cuban inv invasion. He bought their plan, and the plan was that uh, once we had this uh, insurgent force in, invade Cuba that the Cuban people would, up, would go onto the streets and overthrow Castro, and that didn't happen. So it was a debacle, it was a disaster, and Kennedy had to suffer for it. It was one of the worst parts of his life as president. Jeff? Uh, Cuba is, 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 is central to understanding the causes of the assassination, I think, and the, Bay of, the failure of the Bay of Pigs uh, bred a lot of resentment. Uh, I write about this in my book. Uh, there was widespread bitterness at the upper ranks of the CIA about Kennedy's handling of the Cuban Missile cri of, of the Bay of Pigs, which was compounded by his handling of the Cuban Missile Crisis uh, a, a year and a half later. Um, Kennedy, uh, under the threat, with the threat of Soviet missiles in, in Cuba, rejects the advice of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and most of his advisors uh, and does not in, in or order an immediate invasion. He, uh, he, he seeks a, a diplomatic solution and finds it. And this was very popular uh, after the threat of nuclear war. Kennedy's ratings shoot up. But um, in Miami, uh, uh, in Cuban Miami, uh, the, the statesmanship was thought to be a surrender. And the, and the, the, the Cuban Missile Crisis was, was described as uh, La Segunda Derrota, the second defeat. So there was the Bay of Pigs was the first defeat. And the Cuban Missile Crisis was the second defeat. And the, dis the, dis the dissatisfaction with the Joint Chiefs of Staff was quite profound, too. Um, and there's a history of, of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, the official history, uh, which came out in the 90s. And they described that after the Cuban Missile Crisis, the relations between the US President and the Joint Chiefs of Staff had never been so low. The relationship had never been so bad. And the culmination of that was, as the speaker mentioned, was the signing of the limited test ban treaty, which most of the chiefs opposed. So you have a very big rift between Kennedy and his national security agencies in the later months of 1963. I'm not saying that that's a, a, a cause of the assassination, but that is indisputably the world in which Kennedy lived and died. Mr. Davis. I totally disagree with my colleague. I think that the decision the president made on the Cuban Missile Crisis was correct courageous and successful. I totally agree. I'm, I'm saying in, in Cuban Miami, it and was regarded as, as well, a Well, naturally. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised by that. But it, I covered the White House. I covered those 13 days and watched President Kennedy handle the situation. I was in Chicago with him the few days before when they said he had a cold and had to rush back to Washington when the first films were developed showing that the Soviets had armed missiles and they were armed in Cuba. And I think when you're you're, at the time, Ken President Kennedy was 44 years old, facing the Joint Chiefs of Staff, men much older than him. Each of them had four stars on their shoulders. He was a Lieutenant J.G., a lowly Lieutenant J.G. in the United States Navy, facing these men, Joint Chiefs of Staff, including his Secretary of State and others. And they came to work every day during those 13 days when we were hanging by a thread on whether there was going to be nuclear war. And finally, Kennedy looked at them all and said, we're not going to bomb, we're not going to invade, we're going to blockade. It saved the world from World War III, uh, which would have been a nuclear war. We learned later that there were 45,000 Soviet troops in Cuba at that time. Had any of our weapons, our airplanes, killed a single Soviet soldier, Khrushchev would have been forced to go to war against us. I think it was a stroke of genius that Kennedy stood them down, 13 difficult days, but it showed that he did have the courage to do it. I think he saved the world from 
World War, World War III, which would have been nuclear and no question about it. The missiles in Cuba were armed. They could have reached as far as Chicago. And our missiles were aimed at the Soviet Union. The most brilliant thing Kennedy did in the October 22nd speech in 1962 when he went on television before the American people was that he told the Soviet Union that we will consider an attack upon the United States not by Cuba but by the Soviet Union and we'll take proper military action which would have meant our missiles would go to Russia on Soviet territory and not to Cuba. And I think that's what cooled Mr. Khrushchev down and brought him to his senses. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. Of course, I think Jeff is making the point that because he did stare down the generals, some of the generals uh, in the Pentagon and maybe defense contractors weren't terribly happy with him, and that, that might have been a motive for the assassination. The problem is there's so many people with means, motive, and opportunity. But it, and it's the, C, the CIA connection with, with the invasion oh. of Cuba, you see, that failed. It was a setup. It could be argued it was a setup to fail and force us to invade Cuba in 1961. All right. Well, we're going to have to go. I uh, thank you, sir. That was a good question. Let's go to several in the back here so that we can get to them. My yes, question is much less probing. Um, you know, when I, I was in third grade, do you have a book, sir? Is that what you're going to do? Oh, you know, but, oh. No, but I'm working on one. I'd be happy to. Um, <laughs> well, I was in third grade when this happened, and. Um, you know, it, for those of you who were around at that particular time, you remember all the books that came out of, about Kennedy and the assassination. People could buy copies of the Warren Commission report years later. And I had a copy of um, The Torture <laughs> Past. Which was a, I've you know, got that. Ah, I still do too. And uh, there's a picture that was shown tonight um, as well that's in that that has Kennedy grasping his throat and a picture of the bookstore depository entrance in the background. There's a guy in the top upper left corner that is a dead ringer, no pun intended, for Lee Harvey Oswald. And I've always wondered, you know, how do we, you know, how much um, work was done in tracing what Oswald did that day and in the hours um, following till the time that he was captured? Well, that wasn't him. There has been analysis on, on that photo. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, that was a guy named Billy Love, Lovelady. Lovelady. That was not. Yeah, he 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 really had. In fact, I found him out in West Texas, and uh, he he uh, he was a little bit like Marina Oswald. He he was willing to provide a story for money, and uh, we were doing that. <laughs> Tell him about Marina just for a minute. Because you had a great story on Marina, yeah, Marina the wife of Lee. Marina, she <coughs> be, uh, somebody that I knew fairly well because I wanted to talk to her about Lee. And we got to know each other a little bit. And anyway, one thing led to another. And, but she would never talk to me on the record. And finally the day came when she always said, you've got to pay me. This is all I've got. This is all I've got. One great thing I don't think I've ever told before, but she said once, you know, I married him, and the son of a bitch never fixed my teeth. <laughs> he promised to fix my teeth, and he didn't fix my teeth. But anyway. Well, that's important. <laughs> it came, we all want our teeth fixed. I understand that. It, it came down to her. Uh, one, one time I said, well, well, how much money do you want? I mean, what if I gave you $50,000? for an interview. I mean, what kind of things would you tell me? And she said, I'll tell you anything you want to hear. <laughs> and remember that, because it's really true. There are a lot of people involved in this story who have flexible stories and who've switched them for the right incentives. Be very careful. Not to mention Lee's mother. Oh, what a case she was. Margarita Oswald. Yeah. On, on the afternoon, Lee Oswald, allegedly, Shot John F. Kennedy. She's traveling in a car with now Bob Schieffer, who was a reporter for the Fort Worth Star-Telegram. Uh, her son had just been accused of killing the President of the United States, and she's saying to him, uh, nobody's going to care about Mama. The wife's going to get all the money. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up? All right, let me, let's see. Let's, who's next? I lost track of who's next. Okay, there you go. <coughs> Uh, Mr. Hurt, in your book where you interview all those Marines, could you talk a little bit about what they had to say about Lee Harvey Oswald's ability as a marksman? 
Uh, well, th this runs against the uh, Warren Commission and, and, and others, but the, the, there's a term that I heard over and over that in the Marine Corps, a person that couldn't shoot was known as a SHIT bird. And that's what these fellows thought. And as you know, uh, Lee Oswald could not drive a car. I mean, he wasn't gifted. And, and maybe Mr. Fraser can, can add to this, but he was not the kind of guy that was, was adroit at using his hands. And anyway, the Marines, I never, I never found a Marine who thought Oswald could even dream of doing the shooting that he was, that he was uh, is believed to have done. Now, Sheriff, you would make the point, I think, that since he did it, he must have been able to do it. <laughs> M and Mr. Frazier, did reaction. you get any sense of Oswald in that, in that way? I guess he was carrying books, so that may not be a uh, but anyway. Let me say also, Mr. Hurt, I have seen reports that were purported purported to be copies, true copies of Oswald's Marine Firearms record. He qualified as a marksman, the low grade of qualifying, but he was a qualified marksman. Now, someone might have put a ringer in the reports because I wasn't there when they were created, but they were in good faith reported to me to be honest copies, and they were with other legitimate copies of, of Marine data. So. The, the thing in uh, 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 Oliver Stone's movie where he says he couldn't shoot the bright side of a brick barn. He got Maggie's drawers. Uh, no, he, he qualified. He did qualify as uh, well, It wasn't that hard of a shot either, really. But also, remember, before you can go out in the field in, in, as a Marine, it's my understanding of the Marine Corps policy. You must qualify or you don't go out as a rifleman in the Marine Corps. You, they don't want you in the Marine Corps if you can't be a full Marine in all parts. All right, got to get these last two questions and then I'm going to dismiss class so you can all go to the bookstore. Uh, let's get this, this gentleman. Are you, are you next? I'm sorry. Which one's next? Okay, I'm, there you go. I was a graduate student at Berkeley when I got the news. I was working on a PhD in physical chemistry, so I have some comments and some questions that are very technical. I'd like to ask Mr. Davis, when he was absolutely positive that he heard three shots, how many of the people on the bus had experience firing high-powered military rifles and were familiar with the sounds they make? Only one other that I'm aware of, that two people, well, no one person was uh, Bob Pierpoint of CBS. Merriman Smith, the senior correspondent I talked to, uh, talked to you about, was in what we call the wire car. He was in a pool, what we call a pool car where they put some reporters are up about three car lengths behind the president. Merriman Smith was in uh, the car about three cars behind the president, behind the follow-up car, which is Secret Service. Merriman Smith was a gun nut, if you want to call it that. He knew all about guns. He owned a bunch of them. And uh, Merriman Smith's dead now, but he, he, he had claimed to have heard three shots as well. And uh, Clint Hill, who was Mrs. Kennedy's Secret Service agent, says he only heard two shots. And that, I think that goes with what one of the gentlemen said here, who heard the first shot? Something you don't, you, you don't count the first shot, you hear the second and third. And Clint Except Hill, who was right down on the street near the presidential limousine, said he heard two shots. We, on the press bus, all agreed afterwards, we heard three. And uh, I don't think I was wrong, I don't think I imagined it, but that's the way I felt it. I think people have a, a right to disagree with each other, but I thought there were three. Well, the, the comment I'd like to make is before I went to college, I fired at least 200 rounds of a military rifle very similar to this. And I would fire into the side of a hill to zero in before deer season. And you hear a very sharp report from the primary rifle fire, and then you get an echo off of the hill. I never fired a high-powered rifle in a city between buildings, but I dare submit that you would hear several echoes so these sounds that were being heard cannot be absolutely certain to be primary shots. I wouldn't refute you on that. Now, I'm just telling you what I heard. That's all I can say because I haven't read the rest of the stuff. Now, as far as the silver bullet's concerned, this is a full military jacket, copper jacketed round. It goes through people and all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's a hypersonic bullet. It's traveling at about 2,000 feet per second. So uh, 
there's no no reason to doubt the silver bullet business. Uh, it, it can go through a couple of people and, and not be mushroomed or torn into shreds like a lead bullet would be, because this thing is a full metal jacket. It's designed to pierce, and it's being fired at a very high velocity. But, so but, we're, but I, sir, I don't see any problem with the silver no, bullet business. But we're talking about an ancient rifle, not a modern weapon. And we're sir, that was a modern ancient... weapon in those days. Well, okay. Well, it was it was a World War II vintage, wasn't it? Yeah. Right yeah. after World War II, and this was yeah. 1963. Yeah, was well, Italian... but that, that's still a full metal jacket. It's got 2,000 feet per second. It could go through my gut and yours too if it lined up right. Well, don't do that. But... No, I don't want to. <laughs> I believe that's you. all. Strictly okay. technical details. Okay. Very if good. You, no, it's very interesting. Larry, yes. If you if you were to read Merriman Smith's first story, which won him the Pulitzer Prize, and he had no access to any other reporters. He was in wire car with the president, and he got to a telephone. Was, he was on the telephone in the wire car. There was one telephone in the wire car. And Merriman Smith's first flash to the United Press International was, three shots were fired into the presidential motorcade today. President Kennedy may have been mortally hit. Brilliant lead. He was right on the mark on the wound on the president, but his first words were, three shots were fired into the motorcade. And he was closer to it than we were on the bus. And he had the strength to fight another reporter for the one car phone and beat, beat him on the story yeah, yeah. of the century. Right. Which is a so whole, other, I, pa whole there, other panel. Yeah, there you right. go. Right. Last question. I hate to end it. We could <coughs> literally go on all night, but then you wouldn't see the press conference tomorrow morning. Yes. Well, just, just anecdotally, <clears throat> I, I just would like to say that I was working for United Press in Caracas at the time that this happened, and I happened to be standing in front of the ticker reading the news when the report from Merriman Smith came across and we could see the ring, bell started to ring in the machine, which very rarely happened. In any case, my question is, <clears throat> first of all, if the package that he was carrying on that morning was two feet long. Does anyone have an explanation as to how you could fold a Menlicher Carcano rifle down <coughs> into a package that size, um, number one? And if the f shots were fired from that rifle in six to eight seconds, as they supposedly were, how do you uh, re re uh, work the bolt on that rifle fast enough to fire three shots in that time frame. Right, well, Explain I'm, to I'm you, gonna... sir, that you only have to count the two times, the second and third time you work the bolt. The first shot is a freebie. The clock doesn't start till the first shot's on its way. You only have to account for shot two and shot three. And it was about that, seven point something right. seconds. That gives you about three and a half seconds to shot. My range man beat that by far when he went to the Neely Plaza with the, the uh, House Select Committee to do test firings and, and uh, recordings from various places about the Neely Plaza. And I'll also throw a little, little aside in there. When those re uh, motorcycle radios recorded these test shots at the behest of the House Select Committee, they recorded pow, 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 pow. Not supersonic impressions, marks, on a belt that was only qualified to receive telephone grade communications, 200 to 2,000 hertz. So there's your, your count on your, your shooting. Your first shot is a freebie. You have the full seven, seven and a half seconds to get off two shots. No, no problem. Uh, thank you, Sheriff. I want to get uh, finish up here with going back to Mr. Frazier because he had, to answer your first question, an experience with the Warren Commission that I want you to hear about because, it, you know, briefly your, your question to answer it is it, it's not easy to get that particular rifle disassembled in a package 
uh, as small as Oswald was, was supposedly carrying, or as Mr. Frazier reported he was carrying. Tell them about your trip to the Warren Commission, what they made you do in terms of cutting that brown paper that you told me and I included in the book. Uh, my sister and I, we uh, reported to the Warren Commission and we testified. And while we were there, one of the things we did, we had to make a bags like the one we uh, saw briefly. And here's the thing. We didn't have a yardstick. Any measuring device, all we had was our eyes and a pair of scissors and tape. And I can't tell you how many bags we made. And they wouldn't let you lay, make a bag and lay it over there where you could make it the same length. We had to do it from memory. And we did this countless times. And they tried very hard to make us change our testimony. And when we would not change their testimony, here's the punchline. They said, they simply don't know. And I said to myself, they have the gall to call you a liar, and you don't know what you're talking about. Where were they? Where were they that day? <coughs> Out on a golf course somewhere 1,500 miles away, but they know more than you? Uh, things like that is a baggage my sister and I, we've had to carry for many years. And she passed away last year. Knowing that people believe everything they read. And I tell you this, from this day on, regardless what happens, when you read a story in a magazine, newspaper, or you hear it on uh, some uh, TV or however, you ask yourself when you get to listening or reading that item, how much of that is really the truth? Not very much, frequently. M Mr. Frazier, I, wa I want you all to read that story in the book. It's very powerful, and frankly, I used it as an example, along with several others, of how the Warren Commission, maybe they were right in their conclusions, but they frequently came across evidence that did not fit and so they disallowed it. They would always say, well, that person's wrong. That person's wrong. That person misremembered. They weren't there. As Mr. Frazier said, he was there. I hate to bring this to a close, and those of you with additional questions can come up, but you have been a great audience. You've listened to this very patiently, but honestly, wasn't it fascinating? Weren't they terrific? Now, don't forget to go to the centerforpolitics.org. We're live streaming at 10 a.m. tomorrow morning, and I think you'll see some interesting things if you tune in. Thank you all so much for coming.